Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse episode 348. I am Peter and joining me as always is Matt. Hey, bingering. This is a DC Comics podcast. We get together and we talk about a bunch of DC comic books that we read this past week. It's really quite that simple. Coming up on this week's show, we have Superman Lost issue one. Uh, Matt tried Lazarus Planet Revenge of the Gods. Uh, we'll be talking about Justice Society of America issue three we're on. I've written down issue one because I'm in yeah, the Yeah, it's issue three. Uh, we're going to be talking about Batgirls issue 16. Matt is still reading Wildcats with issue number five. And then, of course, we'll be talking about Danger Street issue four. So that is uh, what's coming up on the show this week. Yeah. Plus, I, I like... I like how you structure them like your wrestling card. So Danger Street's the main event. <laughs> I mean, you I know? don't necessarily usually do that, but it's kind of just worked out that way in that mm-hmm. some of the best books are these, because what I put at the end tend to be the stuff that's not in the DC universe, like right. current canon, if you will. Right. So that it's stuff, it's like the Black Label stuff. It's these Tom mm-hmm. King prestige books. But because a lot of them have ended up being the best books that we've been reading, it's kind of worked out that the best books have been safe yeah. to last. Not well, always, but often. No, and then and then you got something like Superman Lost, you know, opening the show, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, that's the that's like the Young Bucks match. Well, you know? <laughs> under this logic, uh, Wildcats issue five is in the death slot. So yeah, well, <laughs> you might not be too far off. <laughs> <laughs> it's the popcorn match, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and not to get everyone too excited, if this excites anyone, but there's a good chance that a certain ginger menace might be on the show next week for not the big episode of 350, but you'll be here for 349. <laughs> that, is, that is kind of Connor. This is the, you need to make up an AEW like graphic of Connor Ryan addresses Address, his Addresses enemies. his enemies. That's yeah. not the first thing that came out of my yeah. head. <laughs> he he kind of is our Eddie Kingston, right? Like, he just comes on, I'm yells mean. about stuff that makes him unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know. Uh, I could keep going with this analogy, but honestly, it's just alienating second by second every one of our fans who it, do not follow wrestling. <laughs> but it is spot on, right? Like It's it's, it's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. Uh, yeah. We also have solicits as well, which is the other thing I was going to say, is that we've got June solicits to look at, so that's obviously a big chunk of the show yeah. to start with as well. If there... If there was one wrestler that got their arm broken by a dog, it was definitely Eddie Kingston. Solicits! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we got solicits. Doing solicits. Exciting stuff. Um, I've not even looked at him yet. I just I know some of the stuff that we talked about last week in the news is in there, but other than that, I don't know what's, what's popping up. So it'll be a, a journey of discovery for us all to yep. go on. Um, you know, b- before we get into anything else, I, I, I will say that... Uh, Shazam Fury of the Gods is out this weekend and it was tracking for like 40 million opening a few days ago but in the last couple of days it's went down further to its ceiling is now 30 million and it might be as low as 24 uh, for its weekend that I mean that's yeah. that's pretty rough that's, I, that's set out to die I, I wanted levels. to go see it and then I got a very busy weekend uh, my wife doesn't want to go see it I'm like with movie prices being what they are now you know, am I going to go by myself just to see Shazam when it's probably going to be on Max? Which is just a problem, because I want to support this, but I also don't want to go to the theater. <laughs> so, it's one of those, you know. Eh. So, also doesn't help that I went and saw Creed 3 on Thursday, you know. Um, so, but I had a free ticket, so that's fine. Mm, okay. uh, but yes. Uh yeah, um, I, know, I felt worth mentioning and passing. Yeah. I, I, there wasn't. Well, really when you much. said it was, it was tracking for forty million. That that made me very hopeful. And then, as you said, as it slowly didn't, <laughs> I got very sad. Yeah. For all of forty was, I think forty still. Oh, well, actually, I can't remember what the first first one's opening mm-hmm. weekend was, but yeah. forty is in the low end for a superhero well, movie anyway. But yeah, you know, dipping under thirty is definitely. I I do remember that Warner Brothers kind of kind of juiced the the Shazam stuff because. We got free tickets to it through through Fandango. We just had, mm. uh, you know, and then that's we. I don't remember know if you remember the story, but the the um, the theater also sold the tickets. So they had sold my seat twice, right? Um, through the special event screening, uh, it was free. So we had a whole to do about that. So um, I I think they count those towards the opening weekend, right? Because someone's assuming those costs. Uh, yeah, you presume of, of an so. advanced screening. So, because it was like, or it was the week before or something like that. So, you know, 
I just I, I want Shazam to do well. I love the property. I just you well, know. logically I say they shouldn't count, but knowing yeah. Hollywood accountants wanting to announce yeah. a bigger number, that they absolutely are finding a way to count them. Yeah, somehow. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the other news this week the, uh, from the movie stuff was that uh, Gunn, it was pretty obvious he was going to, mm-hmm. but he's officially directing Superman Legacy, which, yeah. you know, he wouldn't be my first choice for a Superman story, but everything he's saying about it, every he's been tweeting every so often here, this is the book I'm reading tonight for research, yeah. and, you know, he's he's been reading a bunch yeah. of interesting stuff. Well, and there's that, and, and, you know, people might not like the Guardians movies, but they have a certain amount of heart to them. And I feel like if he does the inverse of what, you know, of 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 Guardians and, and having more of that heart than, you know, a lot of the other, you know, not the bitterness, but there's there's a um, there's a streak to the Guardians characters that works for the Guardians characters, right? Um, so I, I feel like he can he can get this. I mean, it's not even about like or dislike it. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, I think most people because I, I like Guardians pretty well. And that, mm-hmm. it's, it's not that I it's just purely that. De- James Gunn's a bit too jokey, I would say, typically for mm-hmm. Superman, but as long as he can rein that in yeah. a little bit, I, I think uh, it, it could work out fine. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's so, uh, he's uh, he's doing that. I'm, I'm excited to see what that looks like, especially since he's from the Midwest. You know, he's from Missouri. I feel like that, that's a take on the character. I think that would maybe inform a different Clark, you know, than what we've gotten the last couple tries. So. Oh, and a bit of a... Uh... Actually, apparently Zack Snyder was teasing something with Darkseid this week. I didn't really see it. I, I, I hear that name. I don't know what he's doing. Out. But the reason yeah. why I thought of that is because there, there was a fun anecdote I wanted to share. I, apparently, there was a quote from Ben Affleck that I wanted to share. Uh, oh, so, no. Uh, have you seen the Snyder Cut? Yes. You I seen watched the Cut? all four hours of it. <laughs> right. So, yeah, there's a scene at the end. And I mailed spoilers, I guess, if you, if you somehow yeah. care about the Snyder Cut and haven't seen it yet. But there's a scene at the end where Batman's talking to Martian Manhunter, right? There's like mm-hmm. a little scene at the end. And that was shot in Zack Snyder's back garden. Mm-hmm. And there's a little quote from Ben Affleck about how Zack asked him to do that and said, hey, we're just going to shoot it in my garden. And he's like, hey, there's unions and you know rules and uh-huh. stuff. But he, he did it anyway. He went and shot right. a scene in Zack Snyder's garden. And, and I quote, this is what he said. I went and, so I went and did it anyway. And now the Snyder Cut is my highest rated movie on IMDb. <laughs> uh, oh, which is just funny to me. Oh, I mean, it obviously, it, like IMDb ratings are obviously all over the place because well, yeah, it's, it's, sometimes they're fair, but there's definitely it, some things where either they get boosted by a lot of aggressive ten out of tens from like super fans, or they get review, review bombed, bombed by people who are mad that there's like you know. Uh, a gay character in something right. or whatever right. it may be. So it's a problem with with user reviewed or user generated content, right? Yeah, uh, that type of stuff. So that is very funny because especially the the some of the stuff that Ben Affleck's done, definitely better than that movie. Oh yeah, he's, he was, I mean he was in Argo. He also directed yeah. Argo, but he was, yeah. he was in Argo. Yeah. So <laughs> telling me Argo is worse than the Snyder yeah. Cut? Are you mental, people? Yeah. Yeah. Again. <laughs> I hear that name and I just check out now. Um, you know. That's fair. So, That's fair. Yeah. Uh, I just, I don't want to be in that uh, crossfire anymore. Like I, I ended up in that, uh, a bit of that crossfire uh, this week, you know, about Green Lantern. And I started looking at some of the. Oh, I saw the, that. Oh yeah. Uh, for yeah. everyone who, I want to apologize yeah. to all the listeners of the podcast yeah. right now. It's been found out this week through yeah. some yeah. staunch detective work by a unnamed yeah. individual that uh, yeah. Matt is, in fact, a fake Green Lantern fan. And I would like yeah. to apologize for having the charlatan on the show uh, all these years. Yeah. So, fake fan. And I said, <laughs> oh, my God, I don't think I've laughed that hard in a very long time. Uh, and he, I was he, like, look, we, we can disagree about Hal Jordan all you want, but you cannot take away my entire Jeff Johns run in floppies, plus my hardcovers of, of that. So, you know, just it's okay if Hal Jordan's boring. And I misspoke and called him the straight man of the of the core, but because that's kind of the role that he ends up being in, you know, like compared to some of the other ones. And this guy just had it out for for John Stewart, who I don't even particularly ride for. Right? This wasn't a guy guard. Honestly, I I would discussion. argue that John's more the straight man because Hal's yeah, more yeah, the yeah. Uh, the, and, the he's more the cowboy, I guess. If I was going to yeah yeah yeah. And so what I meant by he's the straight man is right is that Hal goes into these in. 
he has to end up being the guy that reacts to things, right? Because that's his part of the story. And that, to me, like, and that's fine. But there's there was a lot in John's run that was because Hal Jordan. There was a lot because Batman, right? And to me, that doesn't make an interesting story. And the reason I love that run wasn't because of Hal Jordan. It was all the space opera y stuff and all the elements that. And I try to explain it to this guy. This is what works for me, right? And does not work for me. And this guy was just going that I was wrong and that John Stewart's the worst Green Lantern of all time. And I had to meet the guy. Um, and, you know. Should have uh, went straight thanks. to Block. I don't, I don't tire yeah. mutes. Nah. Yeah, no. Nah. Um, because then someone will go, oh, I blocked, or he blocked me, blah, blah, blah. Uh, enjoy who your can, mute. Who cares? You'll never see it. It's fine. Just. No, I know, but still, I don't want to give them that that satisfaction. But um, yeah, a good good friend of the pod, Booster Green, uh, backed me up, and it was like, yeah, he's a fake fan that records a weekly DC podcast and reads. He's probably read every Green Lantern book up until the Jeff Thorne stuff, which wasn't true because I didn't read the the uh, Morrison Green Lantern. But up to then, like I read, I I've gone on record and how much I miss reading Green Lantern, and I'm so happy for Jeremy Adams, right? But this guy was super upset that John Stewart's getting a backup in that, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, and I was like, "Bro, you're getting mad over a backup." Is it is it is it possible? Is it just slightly possible that this guy may just yeah. be a little bit racist? Maybe, and I can't tell because this is one of those things, right? Where, uh, of course, it's not their actual name, right? They don't have their actual picture. Of course, right? It's one of these things uh, that you know he had Batman as his too, so it wasn't like I was even arguing with a Hal Jordan stand. Like I was. But it wasn't like I was arguing with the picture of Hal Jordan and Green Lantern stuff. It was a Batman picture next to a Batman name, specifically mentioning Duke as the character. And I'm just like, okay, just... So I finally just let it go. But yeah, the funniest thing of all time to me was being accused of being a fake fan. I told my wife and she goes, okay, so you're selling all your comics? Right? You know? All you're the, you're the you only one in this show that would get into a bickering fight on Twitter like this. Mm-hmm. Well... It started just because, uh, again, friend of the show, Booster Green, not that he needed backup. I, I didn't about... approve of this, this moniker yes. for Booster Green. I, he didn't well, fill any forms in. I, I've no. not approved this. So, <laughs> the, not that he needed backup, but he had commented that that he finds Hal Jordan boring, and the guy was just like, I was like, well, look, this is where I have Hal in my rankings. You know? So, and it was just a back and forth on that, and don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. You, you, you could kept saying that my opinion's wrong. That's fine. But yeah, but this guy, and then just, it was like the, the counterpoint, you are wrong type of the way that he was writing things. And I was like, all right, I, think I got better things to do. I'm going to watch Creed 3. So, you know. Yeah. I was always say that my exposure on my camera is making my weight shirt glow yeah. a little bit. I'm almost a yeah. uh, Krypton looking from the Superman, the movie here. I was going to say, or that, or you're getting powered by the White Lantern. Uh, yeah. You know, life. This, this conversation brings you life. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. Well, which, yeah, I was going to say, also, it would please you to know that this guy hates Guy Gardner as much as you do. So, you know, just, just know who side you're on. Ah, uh, maybe he's got a point. You know, he <laughs> cool. He's a sensible individual. Maybe he's got some valid yeah. points. He called, he called Guy Gardner a parody of a character. And I was like, sir, you are not wrong. And that's why I love him. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't uh, know. All of a sudden, I'm also, not saying this debate anymore. <laughs> no, to which also Booster Green was kind of like, yeah, no, this was a very Guy Gardner esque performance by you. So you know, I'm gonna take the I'm gonna take the compliment when I get it. Hey Matt. Yes, sir. There's always time for a comicsology top ten. I don't know what that was. Yeah. But I thought this conversation could have overshadowed it, and I was wrong. <laughs> so we'll look at the best-selling books from Tuesday, as of right now mm -hmm. on comicsology.com, uh, which is basically just the Kindle section of, of Amazon mm -hmm. ever since everything mm -hmm. merged. But yeah, so we'll look at Tuesday, we'll look at Wednesday uh, to see what the rest of the industry is up to. Matt, what do you think the number one selling book is from DC as so, of right now? Judging how much I saw it talked about this week online, on Twitter especially, I'm going to go with Superman Lost. You're correct. Superman Lost is number one from DC yeah, as of right now. I saw a lot of conversation from people that normally don't talk, like that doesn't come across my feed, about, you know, enjoying uh, Superman Lost. So I, I took that that a lot of people were reading it. So um, I'm glad that that worked out. Yeah, number two is Justice Society of America. Just number John. three is Lazarus Planet, Revenge of the Gods. Number four is Danger Street. 
Number five is Wildcats, issue five. Number six is Batman Incorporated. Number <laughs> seven is Batman The Adventures Continues. Number eight is Batgirls, issue 16. Number nine is actually a graphic novel, one of those uh, yeah. adult ones. Uh, Bruce Wayne, Not Super is the title of this one. Not familiar with that one. Yeah. Uh, and then, amazingly, uh, we have a big collection, Adam Strange collection at number 10. Ooh. It just tells you there's not been a lot of books out this week. Uh, again. Yeah. Um, which collection is that? This is you, Adam you Strange, this? Between Two Worlds, the deluxe edition, which has uh, both Mark Wade and Andy Diggle under the uh, the authors. Okay. Maybe even more than that, to be honest. I think it may be a big collection. I, I don't think I've ever read the Mark Wade Strange story, so I know I have the Diggle one. I have Planet Heist. That was my introduction oh, yeah. so, to the character yeah looking at the cover actually just to mm -hmm. give you a better it says uh richard bruning andy kubert and adam kubert are the main names listed and then it says mm -hmm. also with diggle wade and some other names yeah so, yeah oh. i have to i might have to check that down now uh yeah. so this is collecting adam strange 1990 issues 1 to 3 gla mm -hmm. 20 to 21 and then adam strange from 2004 issues 1 to 8 so it's kind of a hodgepodge yeah. collection but yeah huh I did not know Mark Wade had done work on the character, so um, I'm curious to see what that looks like. He's not top build, so I assume he's maybe mm -hmm. just done one of the the GLA issues. The just, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing the Justice, yeah, Justice League stuff, which probably set the seeds for the Rain Thanagar War, um, because that was going on through the the 90s. Mm. So, um, because that would have been around the Tower of Babel time, right? That was the, that was that Wade, yeah, yeah, that was Wade, yeah. So it must have been around during that time. It's um. um... It's just nice to see some of these more like mm -hmm. sort of C-list level characters. And I, I say mm -hmm. that with love. I am not knocking yeah. Adam Strange, but it's nice to see more C-list level characters getting some mm -hmm. collections. Yeah. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, looking at Wednesday, let's see what the rest of the industry is up to sales-wise. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think number one is for Wednesday, Matt? This, this is what I'm looking in. I'm seeing what X books came out where if there's a, you know, Sins of Sinister tie-in. Um... Which I don't see upon a cursory scroll. scroll. So I'm going to say Immoral X-Men number two. That is correct. Kieran um, Gillen writing that one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two is Berserker. Issue 12. That's the Keanu Reeves written book. Keanu Reeves. Which always surprised me every time I read it. Yeah. Uh, you know, on Comicsology, I see his name and I go, oh yeah, that's right. He's writing a comic book. Mm -hmm. uh, number three is Wolverine. Issue 31. Um Honestly, this is like a 30 plus issue run by Percy now. I'm, I'm going to have to maybe check these Wolverine books out at some point. For sure. Uh, Avengers Forever issue 15 is number four. That's mm -hmm. Jason Aaron. Because uh, the main Avengers book, I think, has moved on to someone else. But Yeah, I think this is him wrapping up his stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's funny how many comics do that where, like, you'll have a creator on, like, a mainline book. And then they'll decide they want a new team on the main book, but the other creator's not done with their story, so they'll give yeah. them like a, a mini or a second ongoing to finish up their story. And it's like, mm -hmm. why, why not just start the other team on a, on a second book? Why, why? Well, it makes you wonder if they're writing towards an event, and that's why. They uh, need, maybe. You know, yeah. they need that space. Uh, I guess they figure that everyone who cares about the end of the story will jump yeah. over to the new book because they want an ending. Uh, but more people will still pick up the main book rather than picking up a new second book with a new team, right. which is an extra thing. Uh, right. it's, it's kind of malicious in a weird way, but you can yeah. also say it's just strategy. Good strategy. Yeah. I was say, it is a strategy because now they may be selling two Avengers books instead of just the one. Yes. So. Uh, then we got Nemesis Reloaded, issue three. This is Mark Miller's uh, yeah. book with Jorge Jimenez. And there we go. Number six is Bishop War College. So another X-Men title. <laughs> that just sounds like a school. The Bishop War College. <laughs> you know what? Like, as much as I am familiar with the character Bishop from X-Men, I hear Bishop, uh -huh. I think aliens. It's just, I can't... I see Lance I, Henriksen. I think of the chess piece, so that's where I'm at. <laughs> well, sure. Um, number seven is Hulk, issue 13. Uh, by Ryan Otley. Number eight is The Forged, issue one. This is the new image book from Greg Rucka uh, Ooh, and Eric uh, Troutman. So, uh, I am curious about that. It's a $6 book. It looks like it's a slightly different uh, format. It looks like a wider page. Yeah. Uh, looking at it. So, huh. did not know that was out. And it's 50 pages. So, this looks like it's maybe following what he was doing on Lazarus later in the run, where he was doing, like, uh, a book every quarter that's, like, yeah, the oversized. The quarterly. Yeah, 
Uh, that seems to be what you might be doing there, just based on the page count. But uh... Oh man, yeah, sci-fi inspired by Conan, heavy metal, and other comics you tried to hide from your parents. I do love so... Rocket, I can't, I can't deny that. Uh, yeah. Of course, they decide right now before a new Resident Evil game is coming out to give me all these new comics that I mm -hmm. want to try. Uh, mm -hmm. Number nine is Captain Marvel issue 47, still Kelly Thompson. Um, I don't know what else she's doing right now, but she's still doing her Captain Marvel one. Which is yeah, I don't know. Uh, number 10 is Hellcat issue 105. So, uh, cool. Uh, just looking outside the top 10, there's a couple of interest. there's a couple of Star Trek books that are doing very well. Defiance at number 11. Which is an issue one. Regular Star Trek issue t uh, t five is at number thirteen, um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much all the interesting stuff I would say. Uh, yeah, so cool. Oh, and Canny X Men Masterworks came out this week. What, what volume are they on Ooh. of that? Uh, volume fifteen they're on of that, which takes them up to issue two hundred and thirty one. Wow. That's pretty good. I do appreciate that they've got like a, a collection that just like starts from the start and just keeps going. So I think that takes them into maybe the late 80s, into the early 90s, mm -hmm. maybe. Something in that range. So good. Cool. All right. So there you go. That's the, uh, that's the Comicsology Top 10. Matt's favorite segment. And it's done. <laughs> Matt's favorite segment's when it's done when it's over yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, the best part of that is when it was finished oh very good very good uh, you know Matt I, uh, I, won't, I won't say too much because there's going to be a review but uh, mm -hmm. I did have to watch the Uncharted movie this week for, uh, for a collector's judging cut. from what conversation this came from I can kind of <laughs> kind of put together how you felt uh. I was not enthralled with it that's all I'll say <laughs> I saw Tim talking to you about it on Twitter, and he was trying to make it sound better than it was. <laughs> like, like uh, he's seen it. He's not. He's just, he's just yeah, trying to yeah, mess with me. Was, yeah, he was trying to gin you up. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. again, have never played an Uncharted game before. I thought it was all right. Um, I don't remember <laughs> much of it. I remember a flying ship. <laughs> it's, that's about it's it. It's very forgettable. It's a very yeah. forgettable movie. Uh, but if you want my full thoughts on that, check out the Collector's Cut over at Mail Fuzz Movies on YouTube, or just find the Collector's Cut on your podcast app of choice. So, so was that a vote? How did you get to to watch that? Well, we're doing a, a month of video game adaptations for the uh, new Mario movie coming out, and that one was a vote. The last gotcha. week was a it was either that Need for Speed or uh, DOA <laughs> Dead or Alive. Oof, you really put yourself into a corner there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for those looking forward to that month, we did the 1994 Street Fighter. We oh. did the 1993 Super Mario Brothers. We'll be doing the new animated Super Mario Brothers in Uncharted. And the bonus episode on Patreon was the second Street Fighter movie they made in 2009, starring Kristen Crook from Smallville, called Street Fighter The Legend of Chun-Li. And, and, and Chris Klein from, from The Flash. <laughs> not American Pie, The Flash. That's where no, we're going. That's, that's where I'm going from. I mean, Bison, and that's also Damien Dark from Arrow. Yeah. So there's a few DC yeah. related actors popping up in that. A, a lot of CW actors in that movie, and uh, yeah, you know, make of that what you will. Yeah, it was straight up garbage. Yeah. Oh man, I'm surprised you didn't do what's what's that real bad one? Uh, is it is it not not that one? The the dark one. Alone with in the Tara dark. Reed. Yeah. Oh, me and Tim have done that in screams already. Oh, oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Don't, don't you worry. Like Uva Bowles, he's a he's a month That's... on his own. Like he's done so many yeah. of these. That he, we can do a whole yeah. month of just Uva Bowl movies. Yeah. Someday, when I'm feeling really, <laughs> uh, you know, masochistic. <laughs> when yeah, when when Pete is uh, has decided that he no longer cares. Because <laughs> I that's what happens when you have to watch a month's worth of viewable movies. <laughs> Oof. Honestly, all, right, so listen. all things considered, all things yes. like the Super Mario Bros. ninety three and Street Fighter ninety four, I actually have a lot of charm in them. They're not great yeah. movies, but I'll take either of them over a chart any yeah. day of the Ooh. week. Well, they're memorable though, right? Like you remember certain things. 
It's uh, got fun lines. You got Raul Julia yeah. is, is great yeah. as Bison and Street Fighter. Yeah. Super Mario Bros. is just like a wild, like insane, like what were they trying to make? That this is some yeah. weird dystopian dinosaur movie mm-hmm. <laughs> with uh, what's his face, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. Teddy be a dinosaur. There's, just, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's stuff there. It's just interesting. Yeah, they really leaned into the Mushroom Kingdom aspect by making this fungus stretch across everything. It's very so, Last of Us, actually. They, they, yeah. kind of, they were sort of impeding on Last of Us a little bit. But wow. Anywho, yes, let's yes. get into the June 2023 solicitations for DC Comics. We'll work through, as we always do, and see what goodies we find within. So first up, we have DC Pride 2023 issue one. So they've been doing this for the last few years, these 100-page specials uh, by LGBTQ creators about LGBTQ characters. So, yeah. straightforward enough. Uh, some of the names listed here, Grant Morrison, Nicole Maines, Christopher Cantwell, Nadia Shamaz, and others, with art by Hayden Sherman, Paulina Gancho, I'll say. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, yeah. Stephen Sadowski, Skylar Partries, and Mildred Lewis. I don't know a couple of those last names, but I recognize yeah. a lot of the ones. Actually, Christopher Cantwell, I only recognize that name in the writer's list because literally just a few minutes ago when I was looking at the Comicsology Top 10, mm-hmm. a couple of the Marvel books were Cantwell. Yeah. <laughs> yep, uh, the Hellcat one. Yeah. I clicked on it to see who's writing that, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, cool. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice that they do this, that they've been doing it uh, this is maybe their third or fourth year doing it, I think. Yeah. So. It's always always for Pride Month, which is nice. So they, they book it around. Oh, is it just me <clears throat> if they put in a better slideshow system for their covers this month? I believe they have. Oh, very nice. Mm-hmm. Very nice. So uh, assuming I get to see them all. We'll see as we go. <laughs> we'll see if it works this time for, for you. Uh, so the next thing we knew about, of course, was the Flash issue 800. Uh, with stories by Jeremy Adams, Mark Wade, Joshua Williamson, Jeff Johns, and Cy mm-hmm. Spurrier. Obviously, th- this is the usual for- format for these. You've got the writer who's finishing up his run, doing a story. You've got the writer who's mm-hmm. doing the next run, starting like a little teaser story. And then you've got some big names from past, which is Mark Wade, Williamson, and Johns doing stories. So yeah. uh, it makes sense. Uh, art here, we've got Fernando Pissarin, O'Clair Albert, Todd Nuck, Carmine DJ Domenico, I bet he's with Williamson. Scott- yeah, so I I feel like you can match them up here. Yeah, Scott you Collins know. is probably with Johns. Johns, yeah. Sides Spurrier and Diodato Jr. are the new team. So yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. So no, cool. Uh, so that's it's not as the. You know what? I'm actually surprised. I was expecting these to be hundred pagers. This in the Wonder Woman, but it's only yeah. a fifty page book. Yeah. It's uh, five bucks, so yeah. So yeah, not not as stressful on the uh the wallet and page count as mm-hmm. I, I thought it was going to be, uh, but it makes sense. There's only five uh mm-hmm. stories in it, seemingly. So cool. Uh, the Penguin issue zero. What is this? Uh, following the Penguin's death and the landmark Batman one two five. Wait, did that happen already? I think that happened already. No, he did right, but then we yeah. found out in the backup that he's. That's right. He's that's right. right. Under an assumed name somewhere else. That's right, that's right. Uh, the mysterious executor has an lusty cat win. Oh yeah, I was reading that back up. Mm-hmm. To carry out the, the party's last wishes and track down his kin. But when the penguin hairs start getting murdered, Catwoman... Oh, so this is just a collection of those backups. This is a collection, yeah. If you kept reading, it says collects 125, 127 backup stories. Oh, this is... By Zanarski and Ortega. Why is this being highlighted? Oh, uh, because of the next thing. Okay. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why is this in the highlighted section at the top with all the new books? It's because the next thing on the list is The Penguin Issue 1 by Tom King uh, with art by Stefano Guadiano and Scorpio Steel. Oh, Scorpio Steel, what a name. Uh, That that sounds like they're going to get a a tag title shot. Yeah. So interesting, this does not mention of six or anything like that. This seems to be an ongoing we yeah. get a Tom King Penguin ongoing? What the hell? Um, I think we knew there was going to be a Penguin book. I don't think we knew. Did we know it was Tom Didn't King? Didn't know it was going to be Tom King, though. Yeah, so. that's new. After retiring to Metropolis following his quote-unquote death, yeah, that lines up with what's happened, Oswald Cobblepot finds himself forced back into the unpredictable and violent Gotham City underworld as a pawn for the United States intelligence community. Oh. Wait, Tom King's writing from experience here. Yeah, uh, Gotham's criminal element has been evolving since he was last in the city, with his bastard twin children ruling the Iceberg Lounge. <laughs> Good stuff. And what of the man framed for his death, Batman? Is the Penguin walking into a death sentence? 
Uh, not from Batman. He doesn't give out death sentences. You know. That's... Yeah, but if he's already dead, is it killing again? Double jeopardy. From Batman's perspective, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Not in the eyes of the law. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Guadiano is from Gotham Central and The Walking Dead. Okay, I'm actually I didn't recognize the name, but because I've read both of those books, I'm like, oh, okay. I actually. I mean, it feels like that art, just based off of those two um, uh, examples, feels like a crime book, right? So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, this has me excited. I mean, I mean, Tom King going back into Gotham. I'm a little bit, eh. but however. The I mean, intelligence community aspect of it, and him being a basically witness protection. To be fair, Matt, Killing Time was good. Yeah. That's true. Killing Time that was had, good. That, uh, his Riddler one shot was great. So Pink, Penguin was in Killing Time, right? Or am I confusing those? Oh, I think he was. I think I think he was. Yeah. He was there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. There's a there's a so, cover here where he's got the tattooed back, like uh, yeah. like John Wick. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it looks like Harley did the did the art. Yeah, uh, straight out of Gotham. So, that's very interesting. Now I'm still like kind of expecting that to be a mini, but it doesn't say anywhere it's of mm. X number of issues. So it could just be that could just be missing that information, or it could just be yeah. that as an ongoing. But because uh, especially when you get to the next solicit, it does have that. Yeah, Steel Works. Yeah, Steel Works yeah. issue one of six. Uh, so we knew about this. Michael Dorn, mm -hmm. more from Star Trek. Next yep. generation is writing. Uh, with Sam Basri on the art. So we did know about this one, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's cool. As we did know about Wonder Woman issue 800, which is much like The Flash. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, this is a dollar more, actually. This is five ninety nine, uh, But still, uh, 48 pages, so around 50 again. Uh, we got Becky Clooney, Michael W. Conrad, and Tom King uh, writing this issue mm -hmm. with art by Joel Jones, Todd Nock, and Daniel Sampier. Do you know, I have to admit, I'm conflicted whether or not I actually want to... Uh, read this because mm -hmm. like obviously i like the idea of a tom king story in there but part of me which oh, actually i suppose i'll have to because that's going to set up his run but mm -hmm. the reason why i'm saying i'm, I'm conflicted is because like a good chunk of this is going to just be the final part of the previous run yeah and because it's only 50 pages it's not i thought it was going to be 100 pages so i thought it was going to be like okay so there's 20 pages a big yeah yeah at the end of the last run and then the rest of it's all new like stuff i can read uh so that's a bit of a bummer but Maybe it'll just be 50-50, because it's like, you know, maybe it'll just be half mm -hmm. of it's the, the old run, half of it's the new run. Anywho. <laughs> uh, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully uh, Tom King's part's good, because uh, I'm looking forward to it. Cover. I, I, I see an Evely cover, and I'm trying to figure out which one it is. So, as you were talking. Oh, sure. Um, I am not sure. There's a lot of covers for this. Yeah. You can hear Matt furiously clicking, trying to get yeah. to uh, the covers. Cause you, know, cause you, you know what, what book Philkis Evely drew? Uh, she did uh, that Supergirl book, right? Yeah, did did, did with Tom King. Yeah. Right? But also Wonder Woman issue 8 with Greg Rucka. But how well since you brought that up, Matt? It is, it is. That's a reference for the old-time fans, that. That, that is. Uh, I, I really thought you were no-selling me on that for a hot second. Oh no! Um, I, I I knew what it was. You were trying to get to. I was just, yep, yep. I was just wasn't giving you the easy easy pass. Yeah. Exactly. Uh. So oh, some other stuff here. Action Comics one thousand fifty six with a gorgeous main cover here. Uh, by Steve Beach. It's this painted. Mm -hmm. It's uh, It's like a uh, one half Superman looking very. You know, he's angry, but he's very classical Superman with the red and the blue. And then the other side's like a very Terminator looking image of uh Metallo. And then in the middle is this green code, like this sort of. It yeah. looks like uh, what a lot of like nineties movies showed is like sort of like something awful's in cyberspace. Like I'm getting yeah. some cool, yeah. like cyberpunk horror vibes from yeah. this cover, which I really like, like. Not 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 the actual thing, but like uh, when you hear the term "ghost in the machine." Yes. You know, like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's like also oh, green code, but there's like screaming faces mm. behind the green code. Yeah. It's just it's a really fun little cover. I like it. Yeah. Uh, so that's very cool. Um, yeah. That's nice. Uh, and then there's a beach cover where Supergirl's uh, blowing water onto Connor. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so someone mentioned this where it was like, oh, Connor's trying to check out his genetic cousin. Uh, and someone else like, well, no, it's not that. It's He was looking at Natasha and and Kara got wind of it. So she hit him with the freeze breath. Ah. Yeah. Very good, very good. Uh, a lot of covers for that one as well. But yeah, so yeah. obviously we've been enjoying this run, looking forward to, to that. 
Uh, then we have Adventures of Superman John Ken issue four. Um, mm-hmm. Probably not very intentional. I am assuming this rainbow on the cover for Pride Month. Uh, yes, you know uh, they're they're being quite smart with that. Uh, so that's issue four of that. Very cool. Um, I should have a look at the, the variant. See if anything's mm-hmm. worth that. They're, they're nice. They're nice enough. Um, then we got Batgirls issue nineteen. Mm-hmm. Um, continuing that run. Uh, nice main cover as well, but the regular uh, artist. Or the, the regular cover artist, because uh, Jorge Caron has not actually been in the interior since the first arc, sadly. Yeah. Uh, which is a shame, because he was very good. But uh, uh, Robbie Rodriguez has been one of the regulars who is doing this issue. Yeah. So, uh, that's cool. Then we got Batman issue 136. Uh, continuing stuff here. Uh, art in this issue is by Bellin Ortega, who I don't think has been doing the current arc. No. So I think we're moving on to a different Bellin artist Ortega, again. Bellin Ortega did the uh, Penguin stuff with Zdarsky. I just remember that from the solicit. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, Ooh, we have a Cedric uh, variant somewhere in here. Oh, the second one, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Click very loudly. It was actually the yeah. second one, Matt. I know, but I I, I went past it. So, <laughs> yes. Oh, there's an all nice cover as well here. Uh, the, the one in the lightning. That was quite nice. Yeah. Very moody, very atmospheric, uh, very classical. Uh, Batman The Adventure Continues Season 3, Issue 6 is coming out, uh, as is Batman The Brave and the Bold, Issue 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forgot they were starting this. Uh, so this is a, you know, we said this was Prestige. basically the, the replacement yeah. for uh, Urban Legends, but uh, so stories by Tom King, Ed Brisson, Christopher mm-hmm. Cantwell, and Joel Jones. That's that Cantwell name again. He keeps popping mm-hmm. up. Uh, so, cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to trying that though because they've, they've, they've got a pretty strong list of creators on this. Someone, someone tweeted at Garrett's about like, I just wish you guys weren't doing Joker. I feel Joker's overexposed, and Ger- uh, Garrett's actually agreed. He's like, yeah, Joker is overexposed, which is why what Tom's doing in this and what I get to draw is gonna blow minds. So I don't know if he's trying to swerve mm-hmm. us or whatever, but I'm I'm gonna trust the man. Oh, it's a gorgeous so- cover for this actually, with Batman mm-hmm. fighting a bunch of clowns. Uh, I assume that's the maybe it's, it's definitely not the uh, the Brett Booth cover, so it's probably Derek. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there's an Otto Schmidt cover for uh, Red Arrow. One, yeah. Which is cool. Uh, and then we got Batman White Knight presents Generation Joker issue two. So the White Knight what, universe. Just what keeps, is this? It just keeps. There's a what nineties comics is that cover? <laughs> it's been skewing ninety since it started. It's just it's just, it's in its uh nineties end it, game now. Yeah, it's it's really you know knowing what it is now. Yeah. Uh, uh then we got Batman Incorporated issue nine, so that is rocking on. We got Batman Scooby Doo Mysteries issue nine, so that keeps going. We got Batman mm-hmm. Superman World's Finest issue sixteen. Uh obviously still by Wade. Dan Moore was on the art, which is great. Mm-hmm. Obviously that leads to a great Oof. front cover as well. Batman and Superman versus machines, and I get to see a lot of fun, fun machine characters in there. So yeah, yeah. Uh, should, be, should be fun. So that's cool. Then we got Ooh. Black Adam issue twelve, which is the final issue of that Black Adam series, mm-hmm. which just says written by Priest. I don't know if that's is he going by just Priest now? Is he like <laughs> he he did that originally, and then they they started out in the Christopher Priest factor and Deathstroke, and now oh, okay, okay, yeah. Oh, maybe he's going back to it then. Uh, yeah. Catwoman fifty six. Uh, is up next. Uh, obviously, we've been out in that book, but you know, yeah. as always, bunch of variants, and uh, yeah, I have nothing dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, City Boy issue two. So yeah, obviously, this is one of the new books we can't really talk mm-hmm. about yet because we haven't read yeah. the first issue. But uh, looks cool. Hope it's good. Greg Pack, glad to have him back. That rhyme mm-hmm. didn't mean that. Uh, next up, Cyborg issue two uh, by Morgan Hampton. Uh, that's actually quite a nice front cover, actually. Yeah. Well, and then the third cover looks like it's an homage to Teen, um, New Teen Titans. Cover. Oh, sure. Yeah, the first cover is by Edwin Galman, and it's Cyborg holding up a villain, like a scientist looking dude. Yeah. And there's like sort of some lightning in the back, there's some rain. It's very, it looks very uh, mm. flat painted colors, which I think gives it a nice sort of shell shaded kind of look to it. Yeah. I'm into it. Uh, DC Pride Through the Years issue one. This is an eighty-page one, so they're doing a second uh, Pride. But this is, I assume, is a collection of old stories. Yeah, yeah. It says take a journey through over thirty years of fan favorite LGBT 
LGBTQIA plus characters in the DC universe that this collection oh. not only remembers. Yeah. Yeah, I see. So it's so a Flash 53 from 1991 is when Pied Paper came out. So yeah, it's like wow, 91. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that far. That uh, was Detective far Comics far. 854 from 2009. I assume mm-hmm. that's Batwoman. Yes. Yeah, it is for solo. So. Supergirl 19, uh, the non-binary teenager who be friends. Yeah, I remember that. Dude, that was that was in do. that was during the show. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So and a yeah. new an all new story starring Alan Scott. So there's one so. new story in it. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm definitely not going to get it because I've read yeah. you know two of these already. But still, yeah. uh, th- th- nice enough. It's it's nice that it's there. Yeah, I like that. Uh, DC Ruby issue 5 up next then we got Detective Comics 1073 and look at that cover mm-hmm. uh, with very gothic looking Batman where his cape's almost coming to life around him but it's also wrapped around him as well yeah very uh, very pretty book uh, and then just to contrast that the second cover is him in a swimsuit <laughs> diving in the, the water yeah by P. Woods and it's uh, it, it's they could have went for the camp- campier aspect of things, you know, uh, mm. like a bat swimsuit, but yeah, that's all right. Yeah, the parade cover for this one's uh, Batman mm-hmm. and Renee question with the the rainbow yep. colors behind them. Very nice. It looks really cool. Like that, that's almost a, a, a print quality image there. Oh, for sure. Uh, there we got Green Arrow issue three. This is the Williamson miniseries. Mm-hmm. How is Penguin not ongoing, but Green Arrow is only getting a six issue miniseries? <sighs> Maybe maybe it's gonna lead into a different like a True, Green yeah. Arrows book or something. I don't know. I would hope so. I'd hope so. Hopefully it'll sell well and we can get some more. Uh, I have no idea what's going on in this cover, just based off of who's who's facing off with whom. Is that a yeah. lady peacemaker? I'm it saying it is. Yeah, yeah. We were teased at the end of the Death of Justice League. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. So okay, very good. Um, Peace Wrecker is um, assuming who that is. Yeah, one of the covers for this uh, Green Arrow issue actually is kind of got a Hawkeye symbol on it with a purple like behind him. <laughs> it's, be- it's behind Connor Hawk too, <laughs> so maybe that's the joke. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, could just be a target. I don't know. Yeah, Green Lantern issue two. Obviously, we're looking forward to this new run. Jeremy yeah. Adams on the main story, back up by <laughs> Philip Keddy Johnson. So boring. Hopefully, hopefully good. Uh, you quiet yourself down, Matt. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, there is a cover with Kilowog in a hoodie and tracksuit, uh, serving tea in an alleyway. I don't know what's going on or why he's doing that, but it's amusing to me. I don't know what it is, but I love it. <laughs> uh, we have Harley Quinn issue 31, so that's, uh, trucking along. We have Icon versus Hardware as part of the Mailstone lineup. We have The Joker, The Man Who Stopped Laughing issue 9, uh, which I guess that's not a miniseries. Okay, that's just going uh we got the joker uncovered issue one this is a uh... but who's the spy it, it... oh it's just covers that's why okay yeah, it's just the covers, it's but just they, covers i think this is like the same thing as that batman one yeah, yeah. i just i got gonna conf- put him in an order to tell a story i got confused because there was no writer or artist it just went straight to cover yeah. by and i went wait yeah. a minute Where, where's the the rest of the team so yeah it's just a collection of uh yeah. covers all right uh it's just sight of america issue seven um yeah i like that cover uh yeah big star girl cover uh that feels like a placeholder to me it feels like yannon's cover's yeah. not done yet because that, that's a uh, paquette true because it says true. it says the regular cover still by yannon well and then i looked and then i just looked and i was like it's kind of sloppy because there's a cape coming in so yeah i think you're right um, yeah i think that's just a placeholder because they don't have a cover mm-hmm. ready yet uh multiversity harley screws up the dcu issue four um yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got nothing to add to that. Uh, okay. We've got Nightwing issue 105. Oh, that's a nice cover. It's uh, like a POV shot of Nightwing looking down at the city from a rooftop. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's holding his mask in his hand. Very good. Yeah. So that's going to be the POV issue that uh, yeah. Taylor's been talking about online. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, they did the, obviously the, the one the, the one layout mm-hmm. issue. So now they're doing the POV issue. I, I do like that they're they're taking chances with this type of stuff, like experimenting with the storytelling in comics. It's very Mr. Um, Robot, actually. Okay. Uh, if you ever watch Mr. Robot, the uh, you know, there's an episode that's all done with no dialogue. There's an episode that's shot in like the wider cinema scope because mm-hmm. 
the thematically ties in with what's happening. Right. There's an episode that's all one take, or at least you know, there's a couple of tricks to make it work. But, yeah, you know. it's a winner. Yeah, you know. so you know, there's they have a- these, and there's an episode that's in like five acts, like a play. Yeah. You know, it does these themed episodes. So I, that's what this is making me think of with them trying these different things. Uh, next up, Peacemaker tries hard, issue two, uh, by Kyle Starks and Steve Pugh. Steve Pugh is a good artist, mm-hmm. uh, and these covers look good. Like I like the it's Peacemaker and uh, was that Mala? He's back to back with. Uh, Mala. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So six issue many. It looks so that looks like it's part of a cover that looks uh, like an like an eighties movie. Yeah. Peacemaker tries hard too, trying even harder. Uh, <laughs> cool now we got poison ivy issue 13 mm-hmm. which has got harley and ivy in a little boat uh, with gotham in the background as they're having a romantic moment on the lake who is that cover right there that looks great which one are you eyeing up the 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 third one the third one it's um, got her with the tank of stuff and it's got like the negative space mm. around it yeah that looks great yeah uh, Redler Year 1, Issue 5, penultimate issue in that miniseries. Uh, we have Sandman Universe, Nightmare Country, The Glass House, Issue 3, by James Tynion IV. We got Scooby-Doo, Where Are You, Issue 122. Shazam, Issue 2, by Mark Wade and yeah. Dan Mora. Um, so, yeah, I keep forgetting how many interesting new books are starting in the next few months. Yeah. Uh, we got all, all these early numbered books that we've not started yet. But, uh, no, very cool. Uh, main cover is very nice. Uh, that's the Dan Mora cover. And then there's some sort of old school looking covers throughout the rest. Uh, and then a flash. This is where this is where uh, I stopped getting covers. So glad I only took into the S's. Uh, the Flash movie variant, of course, is a uh, you know, like Kyrie uh, Andrews. Yeah, yeah. Less said about that, the better, I suppose. Uh, Spirit World issue two, uh, one of the uh, the the new lineup of books starting up the month prior. And we got Static Team Up. Uh, an Ansi issue one? Yep. Okay. Ansi the Spider Woman. I'm sure. Yep. Favorite African superhero. I've never heard of an Ansi, but fair enough. So uh, in, in African folklore, uh, an Ansi is like the storyteller, you know, the weaver of stories. It's a spider goddess. Okay. So I'm sure this is who this is. Yeah. Uh, we got Superboy, The Man of Tomorrow, issue three, mm. which is the Kenny Porter and Janoi Lindsay book. And then we got Superman issue five, uh, obviously a Williamson's run. Uh, very nice main cover with Superman in a sort of black and white vortex. Uh, but he's in color though, so it's got kind of a an interesting look where he kind of pops off the page. Uh, so very nice. Uh, Silver Banshee. Oh, we're getting Silver Banshee. Ooh, mm-hmm. I do like Silver Banshee. Me too. Uh, Superman Lost issue four. Obviously, we'll be talking about issue one a bit a bit later. Uh, so. Oh, we got a secondary artist. This one didn't have a secondary artist, did they? I don't think so. Okay. Now this is uh, Carlo Pagulian and Jason Paws. So maybe they're mm. doing something different a little bit. Uh, and then Tim Drake, Robin, issue 10 uh, is mm-hmm. going. And then we got Titans, issue 2. Uh, just a nice reminder that book's coming more than anything else. Thank you kindly. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a Starfire variant there for you, Matt, that I'm sure you might I like. I can't see it. I can't oh, see can. it. She's wearing like a a furry top and like disco huh. trousers. So they're going for like an old school kind of vibe. Yeah. Is that the Nicola Scott uh, or the Clay Man? Uh, that looks like Nicola Scott to me. Okay, I'll have to look this up when when I have time. Yeah, uh, then we got Unstoppable Doom Patrol issue four. So that's cool. Then we have the Vigil issue two. This is the Ram V new book that's starting in <laughs> in May, and then we got Wildcats issue eight, and that wraps up the single issues. So I'll just I'll quickly just mention the trades and stuff. Uh, Batman volume two, the Batman of Gotham, as uh, Zarsky's second volume, uh, and we got Batman volume three, Ghost Stories, which is the paperback of the third volume of Tynan, which is mm-hmm. uh, getting confusing, uh, but yeah. Uh, we get Detective Comics by Peter J. Tomasi, Omnibus, uh, okay. which that's the run we all dropped. So yeah. I can't recommend it that much, but no. you know he's he's a big enough name that he's getting a, an Omnibus out of his run. So cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that that's even an Omni. So. Yeah, uh, we got the hardcover for Detective Comics Volume One uh, by Ram V, 
So cool on that. Uh, Blue Beetle Graduation Day gets its trade. Uh, there's a graphic novel set, box set of some of these various mm-hmm. uh, books that have been coming out. We have Icon and Rocket Season 1 soft cover, The Joker Volume 2 soft cover, Lazarus Planets Collection. Yeah, it's basically everything. Yeah. Alpha, uh, Solid Krypton, One We Were Once Gods, Legends Reborn, Next Evolution, Dark Fate, and Omega. I hope the Alpha and Omega is also in Batman vs. Robin, because it fits yeah. there even more than it fits there, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got Monkey Prince Volume 2 uh, hardcover. We got the Sandman Book 6. Uh, so that's obviously reprinting the old stuff, I assume. Uh, very cool. Uh, Wildcats Volume 1 hardcover. Wonder Girl Homecoming uh, paperback, mm-hmm. because obviously that's been out yep. for a while. Uh, Wonder Woman by Brian Azzarello and Cliff Chang Omnibus New Edition. So they're reprinting that. So cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I have tried that run twice and dropped it both times, so not for I, me. I like it. But... I read the whole thing. Um, however, it definitely leans into the mythology side of things. So. Oh yeah, people definitely like it. I, I am not a good barometer for it, but I, yeah. I, I tried it, it both and did not like it either. Yeah, for me it went a little bit off when they started adding the new gods, uh, mm. interacting with the Greek gods. and you know, Not that it's bad, it was just like, you know, hat on a hat at that point. Yeah, and then finally, Wonder Woman Volume 4, Revenge of the Gods, which is yeah. the fourth volume of Becky Clooney and Michael, yep. Michael W. Conrad's run. So uh, there you go. That is the solicits. So less new stuff, but to be fair, there were so many issue ones in Maze that mm-hmm. good, because <laughs> otherwise yeah. we'd be ballooning to it's, it's filling out now. obscene sizes. So, uh, but no, a couple of interesting things in there. New Penguin books, mm-hmm. kind of the, the main thing. I, was, I didn't realize that. I hadn't heard anybody talk about that the last couple of days, so... Hearing about that for the first time here. Maybe that did come up before and we've just forgotten about it. But I, I maybe th- th- that struck me as a surprise when I saw that there. Yeah. So cool. There you go. That's slotted. Uh so we'll get into the comics then. Uh so Superman Lost issue one, Christopher Priest writing with Carlo Pugulain on the art. So uh, you know, Priest had uh an interesting history for us on this show where We've, we've kind of appreciated what he does, and he's obviously very good at his craft. He's very in-depth mm-hmm. with and very dense with his writing. But it's also kind of been a bit of a double-edged sword where we have ended up dropping some of his books before. You know, I've dropped both his Black Adam and his, his Deathstroke, and I read a good 30-plus issues of that Deathstroke run. Yeah. Uh, I read all of his Justice League stuff, but it was probably the weakest of all that, just because mm-hmm. But it, it was easier to read because it was Justice League. Um, so I was very curious going into this that it had a strong concept, the concept being that Superman leaves to go and do something, and when he comes back, seemingly right away, uh, from everyone else's perspective, mm-hmm. he's actually been gone from his perspective for 20 years because of time away stuff. And it's all about sort of dealing with that and telling the story of what happened in those 20 years. Uh, so interesting concept. So came into it. Uh, optimistic, but not really sure how I'd feel about yeah. it. So uh, how did you feel about issue one? So, I, you know, we talk about Priest being real dense. Here, though, I feel like that style, I don't know, maybe because this is a mini and he's writing for the mini and he doesn't have to write for the ongoing. It, 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 it wasn't dense in the way that, like, Deathstroke and stuff was, but there was still a lot of story that he got through in this, but I didn't feel it in the pages. So, like, it moved. Like, the story was very engaging. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I like that. Uh, I like what the story has set up in the first issue a lot. Yeah, I think this first issue was really good. It, it was good because it focused, you know, it, it starts off with like, oh, something's going on, Superman saves someone, and Lois and him are having just some sort of banter about what she's writing, and it's, you know, it's going mm-hmm. back and forth. But then it's like, oh, something's came up, and there's a lot of conversation about how, you know, she keeps being distracted by her work, and he keeps getting called away to do stuff, yep. and then he gets called away to do something, and it's like, oh, I'll be back, you know, whenever. And then he comes yeah. back, she wakes up and he's, he's already back, and she's like, oh, you're back quite quick. And she's sort of talking to him, and Superman's just standing there and not responding to anything she's saying. Like, it's like, it's like yeah. he's, he's you know, shell-shocked. He's just, you know, he's, 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 something's not quite right. At, and At first it looks like he's kind of frozen in time, right? And then you the, the art goes, through, it's like he's got a thousand-yard stare. And you're just like, what is going on? Yeah, she's just like mm-hmm. sauntering around as if everything is normal, and then she sort of moves mm-hmm. around him, and eventually, you know, he kind of fesses up that he's been gone for twenty years. Like as far as you know, his experience has been, 
he's been gone all that time. Yeah. So I thought the, the I, I thought it was really smart to sort of set this from her perspective, where mm-hmm. we just see him go and come back like it's nothing. And like, yeah. oh shit, something really big happened and he's been gone all this time. And now he's going to recount the story to Lois. Yeah, that seems to be the framing device for what a lot of this is going to be. Um, Maybe there's some still stuff that will happen post Mm -hmm. the trip, you know, in the present day part of the story, but it does seem like at least going forward for this first chunk of it, we're going to be doing a lot of the story of what happened in that 20 year gap. And there's a, there's a a kind of like a close up of the, the art to where when, when he says that he's been gone for 20 years and his, his face, not that it looks like it's aged, but it looked like Christopher Reeve to me. Um, and, and specifically in that panel. So I don't know if that's, if that's on purpose, right. If that's something they're trying to draw attention to, you know, um, but it's definitely a different look for Superman just by a little bit. You well, know, it's not the panel Sur- that he says 20 years in because, no, uh, his face isn't in that panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, over yeah, his shoulder. Yeah, it's close, but yeah, so he's- yeah, yeah. It's around, it's around that time. But, um, but yeah, I was not expecting this to be him back. I thought this was, you know, us following him as you know what happens, uh, and not not him being back and, and recounting the story to Lois. So that was a nice spin. Yeah, I think um, that works better because like her shock that he's just spent yeah. twenty years away from her, even though she's not experienced it. The fact that he's come back and you know it's like someone who's went away to war and came back and they're yeah. a changed person. That's kind of the mm-hmm. vibe that you get from this. And Bruce shows up and Bruce is like surprised that he's back because Bruce is clearly, as we find out, he's here to tell Lois that Superman's went missing and they've uh-huh. lost him. But he's already back, so it's like he's oh, already okay. back before they got a chance to tell him. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, then they go into okay, what happened, and they start telling the story that Superman was called to help the Justice League. There was this like crashed. I mean, they think it's a submarine at first, but like, it yeah, turns out to so, be a a crashed alien ship that's in the bottom of the the ocean near yeah. the somewhere. So somewhere. They respond, and the Justice League says that you know it's a a Chinese sub has went down. And, you know, they're China sending their, their, you know, military down to get it. And then they start to get down there. They realize that, no, it's not a Chinese sub, that it's, it's a spaceship, it's this craft. And there's like a, an issue with the warp drive. Um, and it, it's starting to going to cause like the singularity event. And this is where I kind of, not that I, I tuned out, but it started to go super hard sci-fi, you know? Um, oh, no, this was great. No, I'll, let me, uh, let, let me jump yeah. in here. Cause I love this. So there you go. basically this was like a, so a singularity is a black hole, right? So yes. what this is saying is that this ship's got an engine that creates a black hole so the ship can jump from one part of space to another. Yes. So it's, it's how it's getting around uh, outer space. Uh, mm-hmm. So, and they call, talk about the event horizon. So literally the ship in yeah. event horizon also, I, I don't like that movie. I think that movie's shit for a lot of other yeah. reasons. But no, but, but event horizon is something in science, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like, that's where the, the horizon line meets time or something. I'm not... I'm not that well versed in astrophysics. But if you're in, if you know, if you, if you know that movie, you're probably going to think of it when they start talking about all this shit. Yeah. Especially since they're talking about a core and it's unstable and it's going to do yeah. something. And Superman goes in to try and deal with it because if it does go unstable, it it may end up swallowing the entire planet and right. ruin everything. So someone has to go in, and it has to be him because he's one of the few people who will actually maybe survive what he's about he can to withstand, do. Yeah, withstand the, the effects of the warp drive or the drive on it. And I do like that, you know, they said that it would tear Diana and, and uh, Jean or, or Arthur apart, but Superman has Kryptonian physiology. Well, I think they say know. that Jean, because uh, I think Jean says he's going to come in with them and Superman says, no, stay back and help them if I fail. Like Because I need you. Yeah. Yeah, I need you. You know, you're the second, you're the backup plan. Yeah. Right? So I don't think it'll tear, tear apart no. Jean. Um, there's and even there's another person that he said though. Yeah, it's, it's it's same with uh, Hal Jordan. He even he says yeah. to him that the the, the, the Green Lantern like ring might be able to contain it until you can get it away, yeah. but that's a plan B. Yeah. So again, right. he has to stay back. So they they really set up that it has to be him that goes and does this, and he goes mm-hmm. in and much like with him returning to Lois, it doesn't follow Superman into the the core. Mm-hmm. We just see the rest of the Justice League on the outside like they're holding on to the lasso because they've gotten tethered to that mm-hmm. and they're trying to like follow what's going on but we're, we're seeing everything from their perspective it's them looking at the readings seeing it be unstable the water starting to get into a vortex all that stuff um and then they're like shit okay he's disappeared they pull the lasso back and he's gone and that pretty much just is where we leave off and it's just we see one shot of like superman in space where wherever the 
the ship wherever is, that drive yeah, yeah. Wherever, wherever the ship teleported to that's yep. where superman's ended up and that's our cliffhanger for the end of issue one and there's, yeah. there's, there's one quick panel of like lois reacting to this and looking kind of pissed and mm-hmm. um yeah so and superman keeps saying that lois is right to be angry with him and mm-hmm. that would maybe imply to me that because i think given what we've seen like it's not really anyone's fault but right. the fact that superman's saying that you know he needs to be the one that she's mad at makes mm-hmm. me think he's going to make some choices that are going to extend what this trip is like yeah. he could have probably came back much quicker if he didn't choose to you know save an entire civilization stop yeah stop and help people along the way because that's just who he is yeah, yeah. so well because at first i thought he was talking about like with the justice league like don't don't be mad at them you know they couldn't stop me from going but then yeah when you look at with the perspective you know yeah it, it is probably along the lines of what you're talking where he would have been back you know five years before but he got caught up in a galactic civil war Oh, I think it's much more than that. I, I I think he could have been back in like one year, maybe, and like mm-hmm. it extended to twenty because he couldn't help yeah. but save whoever was out there. Um, yeah, you know, I I think what's interesting though is that it doesn't give us any hint as to what this story out there is, other than that little nugget that we've just talked about. Yeah. That he's we, he's lost and he's seen some stuff. Yeah, he's just that's, in space. You know, we see him yeah. out there somewhere. He's literally just lost, and mm-hmm. that's where we're going to pick up. I I think what I was really impressed by this issue is that so much of it is told from the perspective of all the other characters. You know, it's the Justice League yeah. when Superman goes out to do the thing. It's Lois's perspective. And it does a really good job before he leaves of just giving us a night of their life, of like, this is what they're like mm-hmm. when they're living together. He's making, you yeah. know, he's, he's trying to fix the toaster. She's trying to work on a story and they're sort of yeah. bantering and making fun of little jokes at a each bit. other. It's just the yeah. slice of life stuff so that you feel it when he disappears and then the shock of like I've been gone for twenty years, and uh, not to her perspective, but to no, him, she blinked. Yeah, this yeah. this is like a a traumatizing thing that he's been. It's like he's been in prison for twenty years, and he's finally seen her again. So this is a big moment for him. Whereas yeah. for her, it's just oh, I woke up after a nap. There you are. Yeah. Well, I also like that the intro part of it too is you know it opens with this car chase, and this other car gets caught up and it gets ran up off the road, and you come to find out mm. that. The person in that car was a, a Senate aide and the trunk had like over a million dollars in it. And so Lois wants to know what that story is all about, you know, and like, you know, it's, it's how she's digging into this as he's digging at the toaster. And there's just this, you know, back, not a back and forth, but like you said, the banter. Yeah, I do there. wonder if uh, there's a uh thematic connection with that opening little story you know this idea that he goes to save someone who's in a car that's gone off the edge mm-hmm. of a cliff or whatever and it turns out there's tons of money and now this mm-hmm. woman's been accused of running away with this money but she claims she mm-hmm. didn't know it was there i right. wonder if th- the main story will thematically kind of like yeah you know just work with that play, in, play yeah. into that because yeah it's it's almost like the 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 sing these actions have ripples right and like the ripple of of him you know, stopping the car chase and, you know, causing this lady to go off the, the thing, but saving her and have the, the million dollars led to the senator to have to resign. And it leads to a change in Congress and all this other. I wonder if that's going to be similar to, you know, Superman going into that, yeah, into there's, that there's spaceship. A, yeah, you're right. There's a little bit of like mm-hmm. talk from Lois about how this will give like a one person majority to the opposition mm-hmm. because the senator right. had to step down kind of thing. Right. Uh, very, you know. and I think just little details in the art, like they chose to have Lois have the the hair colors in her hair throughout mm-hmm. a lot of this scene. Again, just to show that this is normal everyday Home life. life. Yeah. So the shock of this big galactic thing happening where he's been gone, you know, interstellar style for like yeah. so long. I mean, it's the inverse of that because in interstellar it's the opposite where he comes back. He's the same age, but the kids have grown right. up. Um, right. This is the opposite where he's experienced time and she hasn't, along with right. everyone else. And he would look older. Maybe he looks a little bit older, but he's Superman, so uh, he, he's yeah, not. Right, he ages differently. He's not us. geriatric, you know. <laughs> right, you know. Uh, um, but yeah, just you know, these the things have ripples, and like his his now, him being lost wherever he is is going to have the ripples because he is Superman, you know, uh, in that same way. But no, it was very good storytelling. I really like well, the I th- art. I think that's what's interesting about it, though, is that it's not ripples to Earth because the Earth's not experienced no, time no, without no. him. Rip- but it's ripples to the universe wherever he's at he's going to cause you know oh sure like, no but i'm looking at the opposite way around where oh. 
this experience has ripples on him. So for him, mm-hmm. his life has changed, but the world mm-hmm. is like, it's the next day. Right. So I, right, right, right. it's interesting when you flip it around like that, like, yeah. okay, so how does he respond differently to things because he's been gone, because he's lost yeah. this time, because maybe right. he feels guilty about whatever happened out there, so on. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's an interesting yeah. concept to play with. Yeah. Well, and as I say with the art too, that it is, you know, very steady, like, used to seeing, uh, you know, P- I gotta look at his name, Isaiah. Pigalain. Pigalain, there we go. Art in, with, with, um, in Deathstroke. So, but seeing, like, this other side of the Justice League, like doing Justice League stuff, all all the characters look really, really good. Yeah, and... it looks uh, it almost looks a little bit Silver Age because it's very yeah. you know bold colors, uh, a mm-hmm. little bit flat, very very sort of traditional. It's, it's yeah. not like it's, almost it's not going for a super moody like no. representation of them or anything. No, they're they're very in the light and very bright, you know. Like and we get them all, even Bruce when Bruce shows up is you know. Bruce to talk to. He's not Batman. It's Bruce Wayne. You know, there's there's an air to him that is not menacing. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I thought really, really good out the gate first issue for, for something like this. Yeah, it intrigued me as to what the story is going to be. This actual story of him out there for 20 years. Like, what is it? What does he do mm-hmm. in that time? You know, we've got 10 issues total. We've already had one now. So we have nine issues to tell that story of mm-hmm. what this 20 year time period was. I'm curious to see what that is. Uh, I'm curious to see how this affects Superman now that he's back, mm-hmm. because that has to be something we delve into, is like, how has this affected yeah. him being gone this long? Right. And um, just yeah. how that maybe changes his and Lois's relationship a little bit, or mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, I think there's some interesting things to explore, which is cool. For sure. For so, sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, and they are solid. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Pugil Lane's a, a solid hand, and mm-hmm. he, he nails the facial expressions, you know, when Bruce comes to talk to Lois, and there's She's obviously kind of upset at this point for the rest of the issue. You can kind of see that on her face. It, Superman looking very stoic and kind of shell-shocked when he comes back. All these things are kind of nailed, uh, mm-hmm. and it contrasts nicely to the way they all look in the start of the issue when they're just, like, in their nighties and yeah. dressing gowns talking about work, where it's more casual and relaxed. Mm-hmm. So it nails that, I think. Uh, the action's solid enough, but it's, it's, yeah. the, it's the smaller moments with the, the characterizations that I think it really does mm-hmm. well at, so... All right. What are you rating Superman Lost issue one? I'm, I'm going to give this an 8.5. Yeah, I agree with that. I think 8.5 mm-hmm. feels about right to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just it tickled, tickled the curiosity just enough without being, you know, super exceptional, but really, mm-hmm. really solid. So, cool. Uh, Lazarus Planet, Revenge of the Gods issue one. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to read this and then... Yeah. So it's basically just ran out of time because of, <laughs> yeah. because of daylight savings happening yeah. for one of us but not the other. It got a little uh, tight time wise. But Matt, you at least read some of this, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started it thinking that Pete was going to read it too. Um, so so I added it, and um, I don't know if I'm going to read more of it because this is you know Shazam shows up a little bit, and the wizard is involved with the Greek gods. But it definitely just feels like a chapter of Wonder Woman. And I haven't been reading Wonder Woman, right? So, mm-hmm. like, there's some contextual stuff here about the gods. In, um, I'm, I'm trying to get my iPad to load up the issue so I can, I can read. Um, but, yeah, the crux of this issue is, is that the gods are starting to appear on Earth in ways that they haven't been before. And it has to do with the Lazarus reign changing things so much that now the gods can start manifesting on earth and making people start believing them and uh, believing in them again. And when Diana finds us out, she goes to Olympus to to find her mom, right? Because her mom has ascended, you know, Hippolyta's up there. And when she gets up there, Hera has assumed the, the throne and Zeus is laying at her feet dead, which of course upsets Diana because that's her father. And, you know, Hera's like, well, no, this is our time now. And that, you know, the Amazons go as the gods go. So if people stop believing in the gods, the Amazons will go away. So, Diana, it's time for you to ascend like your mother did. And so she goes back and forth and she doesn't want to. Um, and that's kind of the, the push and pull until Hera essentially makes the decision for her and decides to send Diana. Um, we get the, the, uh, the wizard there with Hera. And so Billy tries to um, Shazam, um, 
let me get to this part. Um, but but um, it, it's not working exactly like he would want. So at the beginning, we get the uh, it looks like Apollo um, hitting just people in Philadelphia with these visions of the future, right? Because he's he has the Oracle of Delphi, and so it starts with this these two ladies walking, you know, with their kids to the streets, and um, one of them gets hit with this, you know, vision of the future, and you know, the friends telling her just like, yeah, just you know, you you deserve to have have time to yourself, go out for the night. And she accuses her friend of, you know, wanting to go and sleep with her husband. And this is what she wants to all do. So it's, you know, these these visions of the future causing more problems. And then one of these arrows hits Billy. And so he's, you know, that allows him to see Apollo um, to give her a prophecy. Um, and we get some, uh, we get some Egyptian gods that come back, which, you know, the goddess of cats, which, of course, made me think of Pete. Um, uh, and then we get this this Tokyo or this god over Tokyo in the skies and looks like it's bringing like a, a tsunami to town in Iceland. One of the um, Scotty, who's one of the Greek goddess or Greek, one of the Norse goddesses starts to come out. And Harry even mentions that, you know, they build a shrine in rapid time to Scotty. So, you know, it's proof that their powers are working. Um, she does all she does at the beginning with with. It's um, Etta, Diana, and Yara. And, she, you know, Cheetah's the one that kind of pu pushes us that, you know, the superheroes need to do something about the gods. They're the only ones that can. To where Diana's like, well, it's not that simple. And that's what leads her uh, to go up to Olympus. But um, we also get on the, uh, on the edges of the Potomac. It looks like this big statue has fallen in into the river and these... Two kids are digging through the, the mud because they saw what they think is treasure. Uh, and on the other side of the river, there's a guy in a in like a hood, like a trench coat, basically telling them that they're there for the same reason. He jumps into the water and pulls out a golden hand that he tells the kids, you know, isn't just a golden hand, it's the hand of God. Um and and yeah, a little bit a little bit on the nose. Um don't know who this guy is. Diana uh, talks to Etta and everyone else about how they nearly lost Siegfried in um, in uh, her her one guy. Why am I drawing a blank on his name? Steve. On uh, and Steve Trevor. <laughs> That's what you're trying to remember. <laughs> yes. was Steve Trevor. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and so when when Diana's talking to to Hera, we find out that Hippolyta has been sent to go do other things, and then. A different version of Hecate than we saw in in, in Tynan's Justice League Dark. You know, it is still a three-headed goddess, but she's a, a bit different. And she's, you know, telling Hippolyta that, you know, you know what's right for the gods. You have to join our side. Your daughter can't save, you know, your daughter can't save everybody. Uh, it's time to realize that. So, yeah, it ends with Diana essentially ascending in this golden light. Um and then it says to be continued in in Wonder Woman seven nine seven, which then kind of made me check out of this because this is just a Wonder Woman story at this point that mm. I, that I haven't been reading. Uh, the back half of it is Nubia, um, which another book that I haven't been reading. So that's where I, I cut my losses and was like, you know, I'm sure everything in here is good. I just, you know, it's one of those things I don't have time for. So um, yeah, Revenge of the Gods. I hope it's more standalone. I probably won't find out because. You know, give the choice between this or reading something else, I'll probably read something else. So uh, the art looks nice. Um, G and, and it's a shame because G. Willow Wilson's doing a lot of the writing here, too. Uh, who, who I'm a pretty big fan of. I'm trying to pull the art. My, I need a new iPad. Mine just crashed. How old is it? Coming up on eight or nine years. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's pretty old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's basically just to read comics now. I can't do really anything else on it. Um... I can't even see who the artist is on this. The art's pretty solid, though. I like I like the way that the gods are drawn. You know, Hecate looks scary. Um, you know, all of the gods, like the Egyptian cat goddess, there's there's always there's a sense of ominousness to them. Even Apollo, who is one of the Greek gods that I associate with Diana, is someone that's always been kind of helpful to her. 
um in her you know superheroing um so yeah uh good to see cheetah she's you know back in her half human kind of form um you know not so much bestial so i wonder if something happened in the pages of wonder woman that i missed as i'm trying to find the artist on this um the artist was oh it's uh c and tormy um so the art's, the art's pretty solid story it's okay so uh now that I, 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 you know, rambled for a little, I'll give us a seven out of ten. But again, not bad, not not great. So, yeah. I'm a little. Uh, you you look like the cat god right now. Yeah, I've I've been hounded by my cat Wesker here, and he's oh. insisted that I sit back a certain way, and he's mm -hmm. still saying how to get comfortable, which is making mm -hmm. my time of looking at my comics list and shit very hard. Sometimes. Right, there you go, cat. There you go. Come on, let me let me see what's next. All right, uh, we have Justice Society of America, issue three, Jeff Johns writing with Mikkel Yannon and Jerry Ordway on the mm -hmm. art, which I, I noticed straight away it wasn't Yannon at the start of the book because it's, uh, yeah. you know, the Sergeant Rock stuff and it's uh, right. totally looking different. But uh, it's interesting, though, uh, to, yep. to do that. I, I do like when they, when they do that type of stuff in comics where they use a different artist to denote a different story or a different timeline. Um, I think it, it helps. It's, it's one of those mediums that you can do that in, right? Because, I mean, you can shoot things differently in a movie or a TV show, right? But but still, it's not the same as a different art style. Um, but yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, also, Ordway has a very Silver Agey, I always thought, vibe to everything. Um, so, you know, this starting with Sergeant Rock uh, uh, was, a, was, a nice, was a nice touch. I mean, he goes back to almost the Silver Age, does he not? Does he? Well, Has Ordway been trying that long? I, I thought maybe back, 70s. Yeah, I thought he'd go back to at least the yeah. 80s, though. So at least Bronze okay. Age, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, he's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so obviously you have this idea that, uh, was it Degaton is, like, jumping mm -hmm. around time and he's watching the Sergeant Rock stuff and he's like, mm -hmm. We get a little bit of his backstory, which is what the Sergeant Rock stuff at the start sets up, is how he sort of began his journey. Which I thought was nice, because it was like, yeah. okay, if you haven't read all this classic GSA stuff, this is a nice, like, okay, here's your context, here's who this mm -hmm. guy is, he was a Nazi scientist, um, he escaped capture by yeah. jumping through time, and then became this GSA villain, right? So right. you get all this, but you also get get the main part of the issue, which is... Huntress with present day JSA. She's she's with a couple of characters. You know, she's with Dead Man and, and mm -hmm. Chimp and whatever. But then she gets taken to the JSA and they're like, wait, you're uh you're Catwoman's daughter? Are you Huntress's daughter? And he's like, No, I'm Catwoman's daughter. And you know, I think it's Dead Man says, I think I can guess who the dad is. And mm -hmm. then there's a bit of a debate of like, do we tell Batman about her? Yeah. And she says no, don't tell him, because right. uh this is what it's JSA business, but also probably murky from a timeline perspective to right. start involving her parents in this yeah. shit. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, and and what I like too is that she brings up the snow globe, which is is, is the unifying thing right now uh, between Johns' work, yep. which I, I, I just think is hilarious. And we know like, Stargirl is coming into it based on uh, the solicits, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, but yeah, the, the snow globe that we saw there... She has it, and she kind of uses this as, you know, um, what, what does she use it for? She doesn't know. Um, well, because she hands them the glove, and they're going to take it to uh, Madame Xanadu. Yeah, she doesn't use it for Ethan, which is why I was, no. I was confused by what you were saying there. No, 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 uh, no. She gives it to them, and they're going to take it to Xanadu to have a right. have a look at it. But this right. actually alerts Degaton, where he like feels that it's not with her anymore. So he right. he comes to the present day. The big cliffhanger is that he shows up and is like, all right, you know, I'm going to kill you all, basically. Uh, yeah. A lot of the middle of the issue, though, is when uh, Huntress goes to meet the JSA, they're in the middle of a fight with a bunch of Bizarro, and mm -hmm. it's basically just that classic thing where she one by one looks at the different members and kind of talks about them and her experiences with them, because, you know, they're all older for where she comes from. Yeah. She talks about how she never met this wild cat, but she, you know, how... Jakim's change in the future, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically just giving us all this sort of interesting little bits of mythology of like how the GSA is going to change in the future. I think honestly yeah. the most interesting thing for me though 
was that all of this stuff kind of established that this is set in main continuity in the future. Mm-hmm. So obviously it's all subject to change because it's the future. Right. But they are saying that this is... Because when they bring up the previous Huntress, they say, oh yeah, I was kind of inspired by her. But right. they established that this is mainline continuity Batman and Catwoman's daughter. Right. This is not Earth 2. This Our, is not any no, of this else. No, is, this is Earth... What, what, is it Earth Zero still? Uh, is Earth Zero After still, DC? yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's Earth Zero, but because of how we saw that diagram in Stargirl of the hyper time and the time versus space, she's like an offshoot reality now of the future. Because this future still might never come to pass, right? Yeah. You know? Oh, so, I mean, by the end of the story, who knows? Maybe she'll be integrated into the, yeah. the main timeline. Yeah. Um, I do like how she talks about the, the members of the Justice Society. I like when John does this because it kind of tips his hand a little about what he would like to do with some of these characters, Mm -hmm. you know? So talks about like, you know, she learned never to get lost in the darkness because of Stargirl. So I just like that idea that Stargirl becomes like a mentor to Helena. It makes sense because she'll be, you know, much older for her. Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, and then like talks about the, the Thunderbolt, you know, is that Jakeem Thunder in, and I always forget the, the Thunderbolt's name, but they end up fusing and becoming like one of the most powerful heroes. And again, I, I like that. That's like, cause, cause the Thunderbolts powered by like magic of, I forget what exactly does it, but um, it's like this hopeful thing, right? That he, he can use this. It's kind of like, well, to, to make things happen. And just the fact that they eventually merge and become like one of the greatest heroes. Um, it feels like a very John Cena thing. So, yeah, and honestly, like, <laughs> This was a very easy to read issue. It kind of slowed because the first issue was like mm-hmm. not hard to read, but it was jumping mm-hmm. all over the place. This this felt like the issue that slowed down and really let us catch yeah. our bearings. It kind of made it clear who mm-hmm. you know who the villain was if you don't know who he is, and yep. it also just like really establishes okay, we're in present day now. Here's the present day GSA, which is kind of what we kind of I suppose wanted from the GSA book in the first place. Mm-hmm. And honestly, the art in this sort of big fight as it's sort of like just going through all the members of the current JSA and just, I mean, even just for us establishes who's currently in it. Cause yeah. Okay. We assume Alan and we assume, uh, you know, power girl and Jay, and Jay uh-huh. but you know, it's like, okay, so we're establishing that. Yeah. Young Khalid, Dr. Fate's here. Yolanda mm-hmm. Wildcat's here. Star girl mm-hmm. is in the current JSA. You know, it's establishing all these yeah. things where we didn't even know for sure what the roster was going into this no. book. So this was yeah. good to it, finally it, know all it's that. It's a nice then. guidepost type of issue. To let yeah. you know where, where we are and stuff. And, and they all look uh, great. Even, I mean, Yannin's art on this stuff's all beautiful. The, the way that he draws the JSA, right? Like, it's just... His his fate especially is so... Because it, it is different than... You know, it is the Helm of Naboo, right? But it he draws it in a different way that it makes it unique to Khalid. So, like, you know for a fact this is the Khalid version because I'm sure we're going to be doing timey wimey stuff. We're going to have multiple members of the oh for sure you know, yeah eras at the same time. So I I you know I like that that's here. Um, and then when we get back to the you know the 1945 stuff, like it seems similar to the Ordway stuff at the beginning, but it's it's that Janin style. So do, it's do a I, little bit more sketchy, but it's it's that Janin clean. Yeah, Joe. Joe, I think it's interesting about that. Yeah. So th- th- just to clarify what you're saying here is mm-hmm. that the opening of the book which is set in the 40s and it's you know it's mm-hmm. the sergeant rock and it's the origin of degaton and it's the, you're going after the nazi scientist that's the jerry ordway art there is yeah. one page though here just before it goes back to the uh you know the gsa headquarters the mm-hmm. brownstone it, where it's it's again back in 1945 and it's right after sergeant rocks died and mm-hmm. uh, degaton's watching and he's talking about how and his narration that ah uh, you know i used to think about intervening and like helping you know the Nazis won World War Two, but I don't mm-hmm. care about that anymore. I just care about me. Blah blah blah. Um, mm-hmm. this page isn't Ordway. This page is Yannin. Uh-huh. And what I thought was interesting about this is that it was kind of like a little distinction that shows that the first part was just the art or just the story of when it happened, mm-hmm. whereas this is specifically when someone from the future is looking at it because they're traveling right. through time. So it's a different art style to fit into yeah. like that modern perspective. I don't know. It's an interesting little touch actually that mm-hmm. kind of makes it work. I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's the, the creative team playing with perspective and time yeah. and, and all this other stuff. And it, but it also helps you, helps you keep your bearings. Cause like, now, you know, this is a future version of Dagaton. This is one that's been 
jumping around time. Yeah, for, this is this minute. is the one that killed the future GSA. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. one that's been following Helena through her her life. You know, the the scary man that she keeps seeing. Um, but but yeah, um, and it ends with with him popping up in in the JSA brownstone. Yeah, he's literally on the. Uh, I mean, he's hovering table. a little bit above it, but yeah, he's like on the mm-hmm. table, uh, the round yeah. table. And he's like, yeah, you know, um, it's nice to see you all in your prime before I kill you all. Uh, yep. Pretty much. Uh, it says, next, the death of the JSA. I'm sure it won't pan out exactly like that. But it does yeah. feel like that orb was protecting Huntress from him. And uh-huh. because it's been handed off to go and, you know, to someone else, it, yeah, he's uh, popped in quite happily here. So we'll see how this goes. It does feel like we're probably still going to jump through time. But I think this issue spends so much time establishing the present day JSA I don't think they're just going to be gone from the issue once yeah. Huntress might jump again next time. I feel like they're still right. going to be important to the overall story. Yeah, the fact that they're talking about other members needing to be there too. Like, should we get Ted involved? And they talk about getting Our Man because Our Man's yeah. you know, done this a few times. You know, it tells me that we are going to get a Justice League uniting to to figure this out in Justice in League, times. Matt. Uh, Justice Society. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Just um, keeping you right. Uh, yeah, I got you. Um, but also, you know, Helena mentioning that, like, her Justice League was killed by these guys, or by this guy. And, you know, what what's that mean in the future? And, you know, how, how they can prevent that from happening if they even can? Because is it one of those things that's, you know, set in, you know, is that one of those things that's, that's set like concrete, you know? Or, you know, or is it a thing that's malleable? So There is no uh, fate I, in that, but what we make... Yes, right. Um, but also, I it's I like that it's it's playing with with the Star Girl stuff as well, right? Like we we see the snow globe and we get Star Girl in here, um, and see how that informs you know if anything that she went through with the child minder and that time you know I mean if like the 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 reveal. Um, well, here's here's, here's, here's my question: issue. Is that already happened to Star Girl? Right, here? or is it yet to happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Right. You know, um, you know, because there's a big reveal at the end of that issue with, you know, with the thing that, like, is that character going to have anything to do in here? You know? Um, yeah, which would definitely, like, you'd think Stargirl might have something to say mm-hmm. if she's already been mm-hmm. through that. But then we may also, I mean, the end of that Stargirl book might reveal that, ah, oh, he really wasn't either him wasn't or, that, right. yeah, or he was doing it for this reason that's understandable right. or something, you know, I don't know. Or because of timey wimey space time things, it's a different version of that. Yeah, you yeah. Know, this is all all at play now. But like, like, is this a star girl that's that has been through that? Is you know, is she gonna recognize that snow globe? I mean, right? like, it could be that everything's in flux, and that mm-hmm. timeline that Star Girl's mini's taking place yeah. in actually won't happen now, but is right. still relevant because of what happened in it. I. Right. The reason why I say that is because it didn't feel like she was part of a JSA at the start of that no. meeting. It didn't feel like she was uh-uh. going to like the JSA meetings, which makes me feel like this is set later, but at the same time, you know, there's but, been no reference to it yet. No, because, yeah, because she was sneaking out of the house still, right? Like, she's not supposed to be a superhero. She's supposed to be at school. Exactly, you know, yeah. At the beginning of that, you know, that's why her and her and uh, Red Arrow can, can go out and, and do all that. So, I don't know. I just I feel like you know when Johns is writing these stories on, on multiple levels like this, and this is the type of stuff that I'm really drawn to. You know, this is like when he was doing Blackest Night and and uh, Green Lantern, and one informing the other. So, uh, you, you know, it, like you don't have to read both, but it, it definitely makes for a better experience if you are. Yeah, uh, no, I really like this issue. It's probably my favorite of the three, just because it was a bit more focused then. Mm-hmm. um it's hinting at kind of some of the futures of some of these jsa members and it kind of said hey no this is in continuity or at least it's you know as uh, now a, or a, w- a similar continuity that we're familiar with i don't know because the straight up referenced one or two things that you know that yeah yeah no because at one point they, re- they referenced the lazarus thing uh huntress says that's right the lazarus yeah she, she says oh that's the lazarus right. thing must have already happened she says that right. so this is right. uh, you know, absolutely in mainline continuity. Maybe by the time it ends, it won't be because it'll right. go off and do something. But right now, it's Adjust in continuity. Things. Yeah. So nope. that's very, very curious. Very, yeah. All right. Uh, what are you rating uh, Just the Sight of America issue one? I'm going to give this an eight. Uh, I'm happy to give this another 8.5. I really enjoyed mm. this issue. So. Yep. 
Uh, very cool. All right. Batgirls issue 16, Becky Clooney and Michael W. Conrad rating with Neil Gouge on the art. So, uh, we have a Mad Hatter issue, which was kind of set up last time, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically just the Mad Hatter left an invitation for the Batgirls to come to a tea party <laughs> with the police. And they give this to the Batgirls, and Steph and Cass are going off to, to find it. And, you know, Babs is on the comms talking to them. And we get animatronic members or versions of the rest of the Bat family and some of their villains. Uh, well, I say some of their villains. It's the ones who have kind of turned good, but you know what I mean. And uh, mm. so, and there's some jokes here where Steph's joking about Tim's uh, robot. But it's a shame to, to break this. And yeah. what Bab says, it's an animatronic, animatronic copy. He's like, yeah, but the likeness is really good. Yeah. Um, so, do you know what? Do you know what's so funny about this? Is that this was decent fun. I did think that when they start beating up all the animatronic dolls, it was just a few pages of wackiness that was not that exciting to follow. Yeah. I do think the back half of the, the issue, though, is really good. That's, yeah, so I got to that point, and I started reading it as I was going to bed, and I was like, do I want to finish this? And I'm glad that I did. You know, I woke up this morning, finished it, um, because that back half is where this issue Oh, it's it great. Together. Yeah, so so Matt Hatter's whole trap is that he douses Steph with man bat serum, so she becomes a girl bat as Cass calls and it's, her. Yeah, and it's aerosolized too because they don't they're not sure what it is at first. Yeah, yeah. Because he hits them with it, and then he starts you know talking in the riddles that, that Matt Hatter does, very Lewis Carroll style. So and it ends up yeah, and also Cass calling her girl bat was very funny. Yeah, I thought that was funny. So we got this full page spread. You know, there's a little tease that she's turning or she's transforming, and you sort of like maybe if you know Batman well, and I feel like, oh, is this a man bat thing? And then sure enough, you get this, uh, you know, blonde hair, purple cape version of man bat. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, so, but we get this great thing, and uh, my favorite part of the whole issue is probably you know Cass is just kind of dodging her and she's refusing to fight her, and eventually just stands in front of her with her sad face and says don't fight me and you know says i'm your bff remember and my favorite panel of the whole issue is probably when she's just standing in front of her there's a panel from the side where it's just Cass looking up at her mm -hmm. uh, saying we we woke up early last week because the, the the dialogue on that panel but it's just that there's mm -hmm. a side on view of her looking up at her and just being vulnerable uh mm -hmm. and then steph ends up hugging her and like picks her up and they go find mad hatter uh they deal with him. Uh, Steph, or sorry, Cass beats the shit out of him. Good fun, yep. uh, as you'd expect. And the end of the issue is, uh, you know, Steph is flying around Cass, and Babs has got her bat suit on at this point. She's got like a trank gun to take her down. And Cass says, no, don't do it. Like, you know, yeah. she's getting out some stress. Let her fly around. I'll, I'll take her back to the clock tower soon, and then, or the watchtower, and you can uh, transform her there. And you just see, like, girl bat is smiling. She's happy. Mm -hmm. And Cass hugs her from behind and says she'll never leave her. And that's the end of the issue. It's, it's really sweet. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, they have a... She talks about... Uh, after receiving the antidote, she, you know, Steph fell asleep for 12 hours. And then, you know, Cass sat by her the whole time. And as she slept, she dreamt of flying. That's... And I thought that was just a, a perfectly sweet ending. This, you know? uh, like, best friendship that they've been building in this book between Cass and Steph has been delightful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's something that I hope sticks. I hope this idea that they're best friends. Yeah. And, you know, it's obviously Steph's the, the, the loud mouth who keeps talking. Mm -hmm. uh, Cass is up not, but, <laughs> obviously. She, she lets her fist do the talking. Yeah. You know? But, like, yeah. I, I hope this, like, awk this odd friendship that's formed between them keeps, because it's very sweet. Yeah. Uh, and the idea that she's able to talk Steph back down is, is kind of adorable. Yeah. Uh, so you know i wouldn't say the issue is a complete knockout because i do think mm -hmm. the uh fighting the animatronics in the first half is just a little bit whatever yeah the first half too because also remembering that it was hatter that set up clue master right mm. uh to, to kidnap steph and all of that stuff and then this playing into hatter like that was all fine like there's actually nothing wrong with it it just wasn't you know um like, the storytelling was okay it's once we get to the best friend stuff and and steph you know, uh, turning into the, the girl bat and then cast, you know, it, it is not Beauty and the Beast or King Kong, but along those kind of lines, like, I'm not going to hurt you. You can be mad and, and thrash around and try to hurt me, but I'm not going to hurt you. And there's that trust there. 
Yeah. And even in a in a in a bat monster form, you know, stuff gets. So Yeah, it's um, it's very sweet. I I love that this book is like able to do these little almost single issue mm-hmm. stories and two parters. And almost all of them have been really building this camaraderie between the two younger bat girls and Babs is this sort of mentor character over the top like Honestly, like the books kind of morphed into exactly what I wanted out of a Batgirl's book. It just mm-hmm. had a rocky first arc, and then from yeah. there on, it's just kind of rated its shit. I also like how they both call each other Batgirl. Right? Yes. So when when they're out in the field, you know, and it's not like Batgirl one, Batgirl two. It's just Batgirl to Batgirl. You know, so I, I like that a whole lot. Like that's a a nice character element. It's very uh, Spider Man and males. They just call each other Spider Man. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. But you know, you're talking about the friendship too, and it does. It's starting to remind me of Dick and Wally, right? To where they mm. got each other's backs no matter what. And if this is one of those that can can go through that, then and it's, you know it's extra sweet for Cass because Cass just didn't have a normal childhood. Mm-hmm. So this is like something unique for her that she's yeah. never had. No, it's the, I mean Steph maybe doesn't have anyone that's ever been close to her as much as Cass is, but no, Steph yeah. had a normal upbringing. Well, for the most part, yeah, to yeah. A point. But you know, I also like that both 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 of their you know. At least both of their dads were were villains, yeah. right? And yet they still decide to to fight against that side of things, and you know, and that that's where they're similar, and that's why they, you know, and and through that bond is where they get close, and just that last sentence of you know, and jump that she was flying, you know, I just there's a whole there's a whole subtext layer of there, and you know, their their friendship reaching new heights here, so. Yeah, just it's really good. I'm glad I continued going on because yeah, that first half I was like, this is okay. I need to get other stuff read in the morning, but yeah, I uh, picked right back up and glad I did. Yeah, no. Uh, so mixed overall, but really strong back mm-hmm. half that issue. Uh, what are you giving uh, Batgirls, Matt? Uh, seven point five. Um, yeah, I think I'll agree with that. I I think the the, the slightly more just sort of generic first half. Makes it hard to go any higher than that, but uh, the back cap was really sweet uh, and kind of hits a lot of what I've been really liking about the book. So, uh, good stuff. And the art is, uh, is solid. Like, I think Googe, I don't necessarily like regular faces from Googe, but I think yeah. when the characters are all masks for most of the issue, like this, like, I think Googe's over the top expressions and heads works really well for a character like Cass, who is completely mm-hmm. covered uh, in a mask and all the expressions have to come through that. That's where Gurji's art actually kind of excels in a weird way because it it fits it better. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I like I like that. So like a lot of the 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 expression work with Cass in the cowl is like these big eyes. It's almost kind of what they do with Spider Man, mm. where you know even though we know that there's supposed to be lenses or whatever through comic book you know reasoning, they get bigger and smaller. Like when she's concentrating, the the you know her eyes are more narrowed versus you know but like when she looks up at at steph and she's sad you can read it and there's like not a face there right it is it is eyes and like a head but through those eyes yeah googe really nails it yeah it's good stuff so all right uh wildcats issue five matthew rosenberg writing with christian Dus on the art take it away yeah this might be the last time i read this book um I think if you're a Wildcats fan, you really, really enjoy this. I think if you have a really good handle on the Wildstorm universe in like a way that I have a handling on, on the DC universe where I can pick up on certain things and and why Rosenberg is making decisions for certain characters, uh, I think you would really enjoy this book because there's nothing... It's not poorly written. The art's, I would say, great. You know, Segovia is really, really good at this, you know, Wildstorm style because... Uh, you know, a lot of the costumes are very busy. A lot of the characters are over the top. Um, I just, with a lot of what the story's doing, I just, I, I'm having a hard time connecting. So here, uh, Zealot and Michael Cray are upset because, you know, Grifter died and, you know, that they have to, you know, figure out what had happened. So they go to his, his house and it's that one that we saw in um urban legends right and that story it's just you know looks like it's been ransacked but that's just the way that it looks and um they're trying to figure out what happened to him um 
And Zella maintains that they, that can't be Grifter because Grifter wouldn't have died so easily. Um, and that, you know, a warrior like him doesn't go down without a fight. We would have known. Which Craig gets upset and is like, I'm, I'm tired of you were, you know, I'm this immortal warrior, you know, Zen master kind of stuff. Like, you need to mourn him. Um, and she's like, I don't have to mourn anything. He's, you know, Cole's not dead. And then so they find the picture of of the rich guy that they had met last time um, through the Halo benefit. And his name's Jason Halliday. So they're like, well, if Cole was investigating him, there's there's got to be a good reason. Um, uh, and then that that secondary team of Wildcats that we met a couple issues ago are out battling somebody in Ohio. And Superman shows up and he takes it up with Majestic. And is like, hey, you're not Kryptonian. Why would you tell people? He's like, no, I am. So him and Superman have a fight uh, across Ohio. And he gets a good lick on, on Superman. Um, uh, but, you know, Superman's like, no, you know, that's real impressive. But you still have to come with me, son. And Majestic loses it. And he's like, I'm not your son. He goes, attack him. And the other team is like, oh, well, we got to take care of Superman. And their handler's like, absolutely not. You leave this alone. Um, at the Halo building, Craig goes to talk with uh, the boss. And um, the the android guy gets in the way. And is like, you know, they're, they're busy. Um, so Craig has it out with the, with the android. Um, and he gets a call. And he rips open his suit that he's been wearing. And it's the Spartan suit. Spartan's one of the Wildcat characters that I was familiar with. Um, you know, he wears the blue and the red. So he flies out to go handle Superman with Majestic, who, you know, Superman is just now, like, trying to stop him from fighting. Uh, Spartan blindsides Superman. The art looks fantastic. Um, um, and then as they're fighting, Superman realizes he's a robot, so he doesn't really have to. Um, you know, he can cut loose if he wants to. Which uh, leads to Superman using his heat vision on his face, and Spartan ends up looking like a Terminator, right? So he has the half of his face is melting, he's got the red eye, you know, and then he gets teleported out there. So now basically, this is just allowing that other team to leave. Um, who I think are the Seven Soldiers, they're calling them. Um, and then in uh, Star City, Michael Cray goes to meet with this Jason Halliday and, you know, realizes that. Um, He's with someone else in this limo. Um, and um, he's got Halliday. The guy that he's with has like green hair. And, uh, you know, they're like, we recognize you to Cray. You're one of Marlo's people. You know, um, they're there to ask him about Grifter. And when they say that, the dude with green hair gets like a T-1000 arm. And it becomes metal and starts attacking Cray. Um, to there, as they, you know, are struggling in the back of the slimo, the, the green haired, you know, blade guy, um, ends up killing the, the driver. It, the limo hits the semi truck. They all go flying. Um, they bring, uh, voodoo into this. They're at the cemetery in Star City where apparently Grifter's buried. And they said like, we, we need you to look at the body because we don't believe this was him. Um. And they pull up the, the like, the grave's not all the way dug, but there's a body in there with Grifter's mask on him. And uh, they're like, well, someone's already kind of beat us to this. There's a reason that he's not in there yet. Uh, Cray goes back. We find out that the guy with green hair is Warblade. Um, to which he's like, what does that even mean? Um, and then Cray gets slashed across the neck. Um, the seven soldiers show up uh, and are like, okay, well... We've just uh, made a mess. Uh, back at the grave, uh, Voodoo realizes that that's Cole Cash, but it's not our Cole Cash. So there's been some timeline shifting or world shifting stuff with Grifter. Um, and that's where the book ends, that they're trying to get a hold of Cray, but Cray's dead, at least this body of Cray. And that Warblade and the Seven Soldiers are standing over them, um, just being like, "Okay, well, we'll 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 be back to send a cleanup crew." Um, so 
again, if you're super invested in these Wildcat characters, I'm sure you're really thoroughly enjoying this. I felt kind of lost, even though I've been reading every issue. Um, just because the, the rate of which Rosenberg is introducing characters, I'm having a hard time keeping them all straight. Right. But also my DC brain is trying to figure out who all these people are. Uh, Cause I, I remember the wildcats from times. Like I recognize Spartan. I recognize Warblade as the, the blade guy, you know, the, he can grow his fingers. He's kind of like Wolverine with green hair, but I don't know why they're fighting and what he has to do with that celebrity. So um, I will say the art really carries my enjoyment of this book. Um, Segovia drawing all of these different characters the fight scene with with Warblade in in Cray in the car is pretty pretty well done. Superman and Majestic slugging it out looks great. But then even the stuff at the the cemetery, everything's bathed in shadows with Voodoo and um, it's the machine. I forget her name. Uh, are are going around the the uh, cemetery and it looks very eerie uh, and stuff. But but yeah, depending on how busy stuff keeps going, getting you know. Um, this might be a drop. This might be the last issue I read. I'm not sure. Because it's not like, again, it's bad. I just, I, I feel lost all the time. I feel like I'm missing stuff in between. It kind of felt like when we were reading Deathstroke and, you know, you'd have to remember everything that had happened beforehand. You know, um, here I feel like I really need to have a knowledge of Wildcats. And that's just something I can't build. So um, I'll give this a 7 out of 10. Okay. Danger Street, issue four, Tom King writing, Jorge Fornes on the art. So, you know, I think this book's really kind of hit it straight because uh, the more we're settled into who the characters are we're following and we've got all these different parts, you know, last issue we ended with the, the kid seeing on the on the policewoman's desk, on Lady Cop's desk, mm -hmm. that uh, who the Sorry. killer is, who, or who the suspect is, who the lead suspect is. And that is, you know, built up quite well in this where the kids mm -hmm. are doing research on him at the library seeing who he is and they're like we have to kill him and like okay how are we going to do that and it all builds up because later on we see that um starman and was a warlord and warlord yeah. yeah uh like they are actually in the same town and they're they go to the same library it's like, oh wait a minute they're nearby i'll oh. the kids see them and sure enough um, they mention they're going to the hardware store to get a shovel because they're going to dig up the dead kid because they're going to try and yep. bring him back to life, which is a whole thing. But I love that when you see one of the kids walking down the street, you actually see him walking past the hardware store before he sees Starman sitting in the car. Uh -huh. And it's this sort of like, oh shit. Like, like the book's done a good job of giving you those old shit moments of like, oh no, like things are coming together and like coalescing. Yeah. The pacing is... is so great it's immaculate like, the pacing's fantastic yeah. no so the way that i forget which kid it is i think it's non-fat is is walking through singing about how much he loves grapes he's eating right? grapes he loves the grapes and yeah he loves them and he looks up and sees their car and sees i think it's he sees uh starman right you see starman yeah starman's sitting there warlords sunglasses warlords and the there. hat on yeah yeah and you see his expression and but he keeps walking and, you know, it's just the way that it's paced to him going to tell the friends, like, guess who I saw? You know? Um, yeah. And then just... Yeah, because that's, uh, the, that's the last page. It's like, cause it, page. it cuts around everything that's, like, all the aftermath of all the yeah. different scenes that have happened as he's trying to tell his friends. Because they're making yeah. fun of them. They're like, oh, I saw a car. It's like, oh, you saw a car? Yeah. That's exciting. Like, no! In the car! <laughs> Starman! Yeah, they're just being really <laughs> crappy kids, right? Like, you know, their they're friend's trying to tell them something important and they're not letting them talk. Also, the scene where they're in the library, the kids, and they keep cussing and it keeps pissing off the librarian and they keep apologizing. Yeah. It just, that reminded me something out of Goonies, you know, something along those lines of the kids being kids. Uh, the narration um, uh, calls her an oracle, I think. This is yeah. what keeps referring to her because she has the knowledge. She has the, she has the right. keys to the knowledge, which is the yeah. library. Uh, yeah. which I thought was a nice touch. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, all, all of the, all the pacing of that stuff building up was, was excellent. Um, mm -hmm. and I did some other things with, uh, like Lady Cop. There's not much yeah. in her this issue, but she's, uh, she's practicing with her gun. She's at the shooting range and it really focuses yeah. on like the panels of her, like putting the clip in and all that. But mm -hmm. it's like the other cop who's with her is like, Hey, should we maybe call Superman? Like, uh, we got this like, you know, leaflet years ago. Like if a super <laughs> villain ever shows up, you'll call this number kind of thing. Is that maybe we should go and get it and call it? 
And we get kind of this, uh, and the, the narration even calls it this. It calls yeah. it, you know, she's ominously teasing her backstory. But mm -hmm. she talks about how, you know, I asked Superman for help once and you think, oh, you, you met Superman? And then it turns out, no, no, she, she was hiding under her bed while something really bad was happening. And she, you know, asked Superman for help, but he never showed up. So she has kind of this uh, negative opinion. She feels like she yeah. was maybe like abandoned by Superman or something. Yeah, it effect. feels like uh, someone with a lapse of faith. Yeah. Right? You know, just just swap, just swap Superman for whatever deity, right? You believe in, and that that statement fits. Absolutely, uh, still. yeah. Uh, so. so it's only a couple of pages, but it really sort of gives you this hint of like she I, she feels she has to do this herself, so she's on yeah. her own. There is no help yeah. coming from anywhere well, else. And and judging based off of the cover, which I thought was you know teasing Lady Cop's origin, I thought we were going to get into the origin, but I do love how King and. Uh, just kind of teases it here. Yeah, what, what, it. what was going on in our, you know, our mm -hmm. family home or our apartment when mm -hmm. she was hiding under the bed? I, I assume someone yep. bad was there. You know, you mm -hmm. have to assume. So, but the way the I, way I don't want to spoil the origin. Do you do you not know her origin? Because it's something I looked up. No, I don't. Um, know. Okay, I'm not going to say anything. Don't anybody tell Pete, please. Okay, because okay. we'll find yeah, out. I'm I sure. his, yeah, I want to see his reaction when we finally get to it. Yeah, um, but it's the, it's the way she says, you know, like. You know, I wasn't too loud, maybe he didn't hear me, yeah. maybe, but I think he hears everything. Mm -hmm. That's what they say anyway. And then it's right after she says that that she fires the gun, mm -hmm. and the you know, background of the, yeah. the, the panel goes red with the boom sort of sound. Yeah. I, that, that was just really well timed. It was just like the way she's sort of dismissing it is if, like, yeah, he heard me, the prick, and then yeah. he didn't show up anyway. You can sort of get her attitude out of the way she says it and the timing yeah. of when she says it. Well, and, and the fact that, that she is, you know, all four of her shots are headshots, right? Mm. And just the way that she says, you know, he didn't show, but you're right. He certainly looks nice on TV. Like, yeah, yeah just that whole vibe from her there. Just like, yeah. I, it's very cynical. I don't want to take care of myself. Yeah, yeah, it's a very cynical take and, on him. And hopefully these boys are, the, are, are to me, what I what I would like to see out of the lady cop here is that those boys are the ones that, that reinstill her belief. And not maybe superheroes, but in other people. Right. Mm. Is that these these boys, you know, who are going through their own version of maybe what she went through. Right. Something dark where superheroes didn't respond, you know, um, and in fact, it was caused by a superhero that, you know, maybe they don't have to end up like her. That's that's what I hope the journey she goes on. I mean, that's uh, definitely a thematic her. connection here is that these boys have just discovered that the person who maybe killed their friend is supposed to be a superhero. And then she's told a story here where she kind of lost mm -hmm. faith in superheroes. And she says that's mm -hmm. when she decided to become a cop. So mm -hmm. it is thematically kind of linking them. The other big exciting scene here, which I thought was like expertly done, uh, was yep. uh, one of the green team is out and he's being a little shit. He's talking about how uh, we have like, you know, we've bribed the right people. This like forest that's been preserved. We're tearing it all down. We're going to build whatever it is they want to build. Yeah. Probably casinos, supermarkets, it's, whatever. It's whatever. Yeah. It's there's like this is our pristine land to do with what we want. Yeah. I yeah. And he's just like, I'm but, just like, ooh, I hate him. This is evil capitalism bullshit. Yeah. And then the kid just turns around and reveals that the manhunter's shown up and has killed everyone who was there to protect them and like listen to him. I love though because there is no sound effects. There nope. he is and I don't know if that's how quiet Manhunter is. Or if it's because this kid is so into his own So self-absorbed, yeah. Yeah, that he didn't even notice that his, you know, his killer was behind him. No, and, I, the, and he's standing there much like a, a slasher, although he is holding a gun. So, um, but he's just, Manhunter is standing there in the snow, you know, with every security force. I, I took personal glee and mm -hmm. this kid from the green team like try to call for security help and screaming mm -hmm. at people and then like hitting his head on a branch and just lying there yeah. as Manhunter comes up, uh, picks up the phone and you know talks to presumably uh uh what code name assassin assassin yeah mm -hmm. and is you know immediately the code name gets like oh it's you it's the guy who took the shot you know last issue mm -hmm. like he immediately knows who he's talking to as the as Manhunter is strangling this kid with his foot. Uh, uh -huh. and you know presumably then you know just just yeah because i i i had thought that he had gotten shot right no and that's just, that's just the the head hit from the, it's the him branch. hitting the tree yeah and then he's laying there and he is perfectly aware of everything that's going on right yeah and again the pacing with with he's got his foot on the neck 
as he's talking and we just the 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 uh, for lack of a better term the camera zooms in on his eyes the life leaves his body and you're just like oh man this just got ramped up they already set up last issue that manhunter and codename assassin are like Mm kind of equals right you know like he kind of like was able to Go, go after him and it, feel, it feels like a meeting of two similar people so there's yes. a retaliation in this very issue where you know later on we see manhunter go back to uh what's it what's his name grandmaster <laughs> the, the grandmaster yeah the leader of his yeah. manhunter cult yeah and you know we find out this is the mark version of of uh, manhunter uh-huh. and he basically says he did a good job right and that's kind of all it is but what, what the real reason for that being there is to establish is is that later on the this the master's going to be in a movie theater and codename assassin comes and kills him mm-hmm. almost in retaliation for the death of one of the kids uh, and it's this really like simple sequence where we're mostly just hearing the movie which is a, a version great of the, the, the great gatsby yeah from 1936 mm-hmm. and he just sits down next to him and doesn't really say anything and then he just sort of dies from like it, it's like the, the popcorn was poisoned or something like mm-hmm. uh he, there's just like well, you got to remember too that Codename Assassin is telepathic. So, you know, whatever he did, I'm sure it had to do with the telepathy here. Um, yeah, but what telepathic? I mean, would would trigger like pink smoke to come out of his neck? I have no clue. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe like there's something in the popcorn that he then triggers with his telepathy. Maybe or something. I don't know. Um, because he's eating it just fine before. Codename Assassin comes in and sits down. And Codename Assassin takes a bite of the popcorn as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not just that it's poison, but it definitely right. felt like, yeah, there's something. But if, yeah. so, if someone can clear exactly how he's killed him yeah. here, that would be lovely. Yeah, because he gets, he gets got. Yeah, I didn't quite get the, like, the method of killing, but it's obviously clear that he's dead and that Codename yes. Assassin did this. And just to, and, and when you know what the Greek gas is about, it's about greed, right? And how they color green, you know, at least through the novel. You know, it, it put, you know, it, that's what gets a lot of the emphasis. Um, here, the fact that they're sitting here watching this. Uh, yeah, and, and talking, s- certainly the green know. team uh, ties right? into this thematically. One with right. obviously the early capitalism, but then also what comes up. So the, the other sort of little mm-hmm. thing that connects to the, the later green team scene, but also uh, Jack Reacher, is there's a scene where this racist guy is, is basically just assaulting this this man in an alleyway with a yeah with a pipe he's just hitting him repeatedly mm-hmm. and saying that he he's ruining this country you people are doing this blah 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 and creeper shows up and it's like yeah i'm not a hero but like you shouldn't hit people it's violent and he starts beating the shit out of the racist with these with the pipe um and for some reason and i, I say that but for some reason uh one of the green team is saying to jack later on when he's back to being just his normal like, you know, TV presenter self, uh-huh. he's like, you're going to say on air that this man who was attacked by some creature calling himself a superhero was a hero. And you're going to have to paint him as the, as the heroic person who was hard, you know, who was attacked by this awful menace. And Jack's like, I don't know. None of the evidence here suggests that this guy was all that good. It seemed like he was uh-huh. assaulting someone before he was attacked. And, uh, the green team kid just like slaps him in the face. He makes him like come over and kneel down and slaps him and says, "How effing dare you? You'll yeah. be out in the street if you say one word that's not approved. If you don't say, yeah, because he wants him to call him an outsider. Yes, right? which actually, yeah. So that's the other thing that we've been doing throughout this book is the use, mm-hmm. the, the use of this words outsiders. And when Manhunter shows up earlier and the green team kid mm-hmm. gets on the phone to like beg for help, he's like, "I'm yeah. being attacked by an outsider." And later on in the scene in the alleyway where this racist uh, gets attacked by Creeper for attacking this this innocent guy, when he's lying there, like, hurt, he calls uh, the the man that he was attacking an outsider, right? He's mm-hmm. this outsider. And I was like, all this time, we've been jumping to outsiders, the team in DC Comics, you know, Batman yep. and the Outsiders, and they're trying to, like, sort of paint them as villains. And it sounds more and more from this issue that outsider's just a term they're using for anyone who, like, is Isn't different. Them? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's certainly like a term that's just been used to encapsulate anyone who's a different color, anyone who's a different type of person. Mm-hmm. It sounds like it's been used here to be more xenophobic and bigoted than it is about yeah. anything else. Yeah, it's one of those words that, that people like the, the bigot that's beating them 
they it loses what the actual meaning is because they're using it for everything. It just meant it's just meant to represent whatever they're not. Yeah, because right? it is the other. Because early on, when the green team kid says it on the phone, you're like, "Oh, he's making these leaps because they've painted this this group as the right. boogeyman of outsiders, mm-hmm. right?" But when this guy in the alleyway is like lying there hurt after creepers like yeah. uh, beat the shit out of him. And he says it, and the, you know, it bolds the word in the letter, and it says bolds the word outsider that he mutters just before he passes mm-hmm. out. It's like, oh, that's very intentional. They want us to connect these mm-hmm. different uses of the same word. They want us to connect the fact that he's using that. And then, sure enough, later on, the, the other green team kid, when he's yelling at Jack, brings up the same word again. He brings up outsiders. Yeah. He was beating up an outsider. He's a hero. So, sure enough, when the last little montage at the end, in the last page, Jack has to report this heroic man was attacked by some monster, uh, you know, in the city. Uh, so, you know, honestly, this idea that we've got a group of kids running the, not the country per se, but are, are high up in a company running and controlling yeah. the news media is mm-hmm. definitely feels like some political commentary on the world of today, uh, I would say. Oh, for, sh- oh, for sure. Um, and yeah, just just this whole idea that, that this also this kid that, it's so funny because he's still a kid because he's not drinking alcohol, right? As he's yelling at, at Jack Ryder, it's like a, a, a like a rocks glass full of milk, yeah. Right. So it even drives home the fact that these are kids, you know. But and this is what they want to do. But they're the ones with the money, therefore, they get to call the shots. Yeah. Um, also, this it, ki- this kid that's yelling at Jack does seem to yeah. maybe be dead at the end. Uh huh. Uh, it looks like maybe his milk was poisoned <laughs> by Manhunter because he's like uh-huh. killed over at his yeah. desk. I mean, yeah, he may not actually be dead, but that's what it certainly implies to me. I I think I think it was the same person that got the human target. That's that's how I'm gonna go out. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it looks like Manhunter got another kid at the end. So yeah. it seems like it's becoming personal between Manhunter and uh, Codename, Codename Assassin. Yeah. Uh, so which I I love that too because that that you know that feels. Um, this is like Gus and the Saltamancas on, on Breaking Bad and. <laughs> and uh, and better call Saul, you know, um, sure, they sure. still, you know, um, but yeah. And then we, we also get the, um, the, uh, warlord in the library. We get that scene where he talks to the librarian to find out, you know, where they need to go, where the cemetery is basically. Yeah. They're just looking for where the kid's buried. <laughs> he's claiming yeah. he's looking for an old aunt or something like that, but it's actually right. the kid they're looking for. All right. right. But he's, he's able to use his, you know, charm and whatever to talk to the librarian to get what he needs which, you know, I thought was was a fun little scene. Yeah, the other big uh, plot threat, uh, plot mm-hmm. thread, not plot threat, <laughs> plot thread <laughs> that was not mentioned yet, is Orion on his way to Earth, and the mother box basically just talking like it's, uh, uh, you know, sat navigation, you know, GPS, yep. where it's yep. like, uh, take a right, and the next, you know, th- after 3,275 miles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's helpful. Yeah. At the state of California, which that, that cracks <laughs> yeah. me up too. Which is, you know, it's just a couple pages and it's just building mm-hmm. up because we know he's on his way to try and, like, help fix things. And he mm-hmm. gets to uh, the two digging the grave at the end. He gets to yep. Starman and Warlord. So that that's kind of where that is. So you, you've got all these plot threads. There was less Lady Cup this issue, although her few yep. pages did uh, leave an impact. But mm-hmm. the way that the kids' stuff and the Starman stuff is starting to kind of build up to come together and the way that the codename Assassin and Manhunter stuff is like, you know, clashing together. Like this was easily my favorite issue of the, of the four, I think so far. Each, each of them have, have built on the rest, uh, on the last one. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's fair to say that each one's been better than the last. Yeah. I, I think mm-hmm. it started off really solid, but I think yeah. it's feeling like even easier to get into and like enjoy mm-hmm. the more it goes yeah. because all the pieces just feel, I understand them all mm-hmm. moving against they're, each other. They're, they're all falling into place. And like, when you see the creeper attack, like, cause they keep calling him the ogre. You know, like and then the narration, yeah, because the, the fantasy of fate. speak, yeah. yeah. You know, and just the fact that when you when you was, when you think about legends and stuff that ogres are, are bad guys, it's like, do they have to be just because there's these big scary monsters? It doesn't necessarily mean that they're on the same side as as evil, right? So I like that 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 juxtaposition here is that like, yeah, he's he's carrying water for these people and his other identity, but he's out there, you know, stopping a guy from getting beat with with a pipe. You know, so there is a level to what he's doing. And to be um, fair, he does have a journalistic like line of integrity where mm-hmm. he tries to fight back a little yeah. bit, uh, and then he tries to push back. You know, obviously he's right. put in his place, as it were. But right, uh, yeah, everything's just sort of really coming together, and there's like so many scenes in this that uh, are just handled exceptionally mm-hmm. well. It kind of felt like 
this was it was great to begin with, but like I feel like over issue three and four, it's really become up to the quality that we've we've seen in these other Tom King books. Yeah. And I don't know if it's just because it was juggling so many characters, it took a little bit of time to like just sort of find its feet, feet and yeah, or maybe just for, established, or just for us to like get yeah to get to know all the characters enough that we really got the weight of everything that was happening. But uh, I love this issue, so yeah. Well, and I just I I love hanging out with those kids too. You know, like like mm-hmm. the pool stuff last issue, the library stuff in this issue. Yeah, and obviously you know, it adds a levity to a kind of heavy story. Yeah, and obviously Fornesi's art is like you know it, it's doing all these subtle things. We talked about the the body language and the timing of the of the mm-hmm. moments and the the lady cop stuff that told us so much about how she thinks about Superman. But it was going beyond just what the dialogue was, and then obviously the the kids like you know seeing Starman for the first time and like the reaction to that and just all of it so well done. And then just even just the it, it feels weird to call it an action scene, but even just the the way that the pacing of the the manhunter coming after the green team kid early on in the snow, that entire sequence is just like the the pacing is, and it's all in the art. It's the way the panels are paced yeah. out. It's the way the characters look at each other. It's the you know, it's all those mm-hmm. things is perfect. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, fantastic issue. Uh, mm-hmm. I loved it. Uh, what are you giving Danger Street issue four, Matt? I'm um, giving us a nine. I'm gonna go nine point five. I think this is, Oof. yeah, I think this is the pinnacle of this book so far, and. It's like, okay, all right, like, you know, we've got this magic, uh, mm-hmm. once again, that Tom King seems to find in these 12 issue books that is on par. Yeah. It's so weird that they gave him 12 issues for this, but they didn't think Supergirl was going to sell enough to get 12. That's so weird. Yeah, but remember, they, they took this, they solicited it, and then resolicited it. So maybe, maybe there was just something going on at that time. You know, maybe. Admittedly, yeah, Supergirl was probably greenlit in the old regime. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I mean maybe that's the case, but uh, but happy, happy exists. Happy we're getting the, these again, these like more obscure characters, and mm-hmm. for the most part, I'm learning about who a lot of these guys. I didn't know who Lady Cop or the, the Thing Bats were before yeah. this. So I had a you know the the guy that runs my comic shop was asking about you know why why I like this book so much, and I got into that whole thing that we found out about you know the the single issue specials, you know, in that he's taken a, a like I feel like Tom King got that book when he was a kid. And he's been developing a story that connects them all in a way that that one just didn't. Um, and he, he's also adding some commentary about but, our world. Yeah, but what's it. so beautiful about it is that you don't have to know any of this. Like, you can just no. read this and it's just a bunch of new mm-hmm. characters to you and that's mm-hmm. fine. Like, yeah. it's it's just a really well-told story cool. at this point. And, like, it doesn't have to be Manhunter and Codename Assassin. That could literally be two other of these those type oh, of yeah. characters and, if I, and it still works it's the same with rorschach know? like yeah use mm-hmm. watchman as a backdrop but that could be that, a story about just original you, characters and it would work you could make rorschach jack Ryder and have the creeper yeah. doing that stuff and, if, and that story still works i mean hell most of the main characters in that rorschach book were new characters it was only just mm-hmm. using the history of watchman to you know yeah. give us some context so mm-hmm. yeah uh yeah, for sure excellent stuff so yeah uh so that is the part of the show. We pick our favorite stuff of the week, favorite panel slash moment, favorite cover, mm-hmm. favorite art, and uh, top five books, or uh, top four in my case, because I only read four. Because mm-hmm. uh, it was another quiet week from DC. I mean, yeah. obviously, as we're seeing the solicits, like, things are about to change in that front. Right? I feel like we're going to be averaging like seven or eight books pretty quickly. Yeah. But, we're, you know, there's a few weeks out of the month right now that are a little bit quieter. Anyway, uh, so panel slash moment, Matt, what have you, what have you got? So there were a couple that stuck out this week. Um, I loved in Justice Society when when Huntress is talking about the the Justice Society members and what they mean to her. Uh, in Superman, uh, Lost when when him and Lois are having their little banter back and forth. There's a shot of him. It's looking up from the toaster at, at Clark, I, and I really like that. Um, but mine's gonna be from from Danger Street, and it's going to be the uh, the uh, Manhunter attacking that the Green Team kid. That was a whole sequence that I loved. Yeah, honestly, that was actually going to be my pick as well. Ah, um, damn. It just it's just too good. Like I I couldn't believe just how I was into how much I was into that moment. Yeah. Then I will swap that for for Lady Cops. It doesn't uh, have to be age. different, Matt. <laughs> I know, but I like it when it's different. Uh. Cause, Cause, that was my other one from Danger Street. This is why I make you go cuts. first, so that you don't have to do these switcheroos. So yes, I know. All right, all right. Cover of the week. I have um, 
I have a few that I want to mention. The, the main cover for Superman Lost is very good. You know, him in mm-hmm. space. Uh, there's a International Women's Day cover by Lynn Yoshi for Batgirls. I think it's quite nice with a yellow background. It's got mm-hmm. Bab's head and then the two other Batgirls are sort of in front and in colour. It's really nice. Uh, the main cover for... See, I'm really torn. So my two final picks that I'm really torn by is the main mm-hmm. cover for Just Society, which is the GSA characters like on the clock. Uh, yep. It's really nice. And then the main cover for Danger Street, which is just the, the black and white image of Lady Cop, but there's just a little bit of the red blood uh, really popping on that cover. I think mm-hmm. I'm going to go with GSA, but just narrowly, because they're both fantastic. Mm-hmm. So what do you got, Matt? So there's also a Lee Weeks cover for Superman Lost. That looks really good. Mm. It's got you know Clark from like a headshot up, but the way that it does the shadows, it looks really good. It's very pretty. It's a very pretty cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But... The Danger Street cover with Lady Cop and just the way that it does with the with the negative space there and, you know, how it's got uh, all the characters on top of her hat, right? And then just on, on the brim of her hat, it says, you know, book four, Lady Cop. Just the way that everything, it's like a design aesthetic 101 that Fornes managed to pull off. And yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah, cool. Uh, all right. Art of the week, Matt, what you got? This one's tough because I I really love Fornes, which, which we all know. Um, but I also the the Jan and stuff mixed with the Ordway stuff and Justice Society are are that. So um, you know what? I'll the Pacey and Danger Street so hard that I can't. I gotta go with Danger Street. Yeah, no, I agree. Jan and Ordway is a really good second, and GSA is yeah. really good stuff, but. Fornes is just next level. Uh, yeah. the, the storytelling, the pacing of those scenes is just phenomenal. I feel like this is the Greg Smallwood Award, where we're just like, yeah, there's a lot of good art this week, but <laughs> Fornes. And funny enough, know? that's another Tom King book that just he just gets all the best artists. Apparently, that's yeah. just how it works. Yeah. So uh, now, Danger Street Four uh, for me mm-hmm. as well on art uh, from Fornes, uh, and then rank your books, Matt. Go. All right, so number one is gonna be Danger Street. Uh, number two is gonna be Superman Lost. Three is gonna be Just Society. Um, four is going to be Batgirls, and five is going to be Wildcats. Yeah, number one for me is Danger Street, uh, with uh, comfortable. Uh, number two is Just Society. Number three, is Superman Lost, and then number four is Batgirls. But you know, even Batgirls, I still really liked a lot of it. So I had a good mm-hmm. week. It really wasn't a big week of comics, but I really liked the books I read. So yeah, uh, thumbs up for me. So I'll tell you what's coming next week from DC Comics. We have The Flash, 795. We got Nightwing, 102. We got Batman Superman World's Finest, issue 13. Wonder Woman, 797. We have Superman, issue 2, from Williamson. We got Catwoman, 53. We have Batman, One Bad Day, Raz Al Ghul, which is by Tom Taylor, might I add. So, uh... So ready. Yeah, big week next week uh, already. Deceased, War of the Undead Gods, issue 7, not a Tom Taylor book. Uh, Swamp Thing, Green Hell, issue 3. Oh, baby, next week is a huge week. Uh, mm-hmm. Black Adam issue 9, Harley Quinn the animated series, Legion of Bats issue 6, Fables 158, GCPD the Blue Wall issue 6, and DC's Legion of Bloom issue 1. What the hell is that? So this this <laughs> is one of those specials, the 80 page, that it's all going to be... It's all plant-based uh, characters. Plant-based characters for spring. So, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well... Next week's already pretty huge, so there's no way I'm looking at it. But yep. uh, between yep. between one bad day and Green Hell, I've already got big books, and then yep. there's a lot of other books out. So uh, I'm excited though. Uh, Nightwing, Flash, World's Finest, Superman, Green Hell, and One Bad Day mm-hmm. by Taylor. Yeah, hell yeah. Next week's great. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's looking great anyway. So happy days. Uh, that is what's coming next week. But that'll wrap up our show for the week. That'll wrap up mm-hmm. episode three four eight. So yeah, Connor should be on next week's episode if that's exciting yep. to you. If it isn't, commiserations, I understand. But uh, we, we'll we'll be back. I will thank our Patreon producers for the month. Thank you to Tyler Hess and the Palacios, David Sharp, Borneo, Christopher Moy, David Brown, and Al Treisman. Cool. Uh, thank you to you all. But you can support all the content. Go to patreon.com slash TV and supporting the show and all the other content we make as well. But uh, you can get early access at the $5 tier. And, uh, you know, just uh, feel warm and fuzzy on the inside for uh, supporting the content. But you can also support us for free by liking, subscribing on the YouTube page, or, of course, uh, rating the podcast five stars on iTunes and sharing us with any of your DC Comics-loving friends. 
should you should you desire to. But uh, any and all help is appreciated. Uh, but that is the that is the show. That is episode three four eight. So thank you very much. Uh, is there anything else I want to plug? I did plug Collector's Cup pretty hard in the middle of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, you did. So I'll I'll plug here uh, at the end. I'll just mention uh, there is something special, which I won't say what it is, but there's something special that Matt is uh, going to be a part of that is getting recorded this weekend and will be out on Male Fuzz Movies channel during the week, assuming all goes to plan and nothing interrupts the uh, recording. Yeah. So. That's a big maybe. Yeah, so, yeah. Te- teasing, teasing something there. But anyway, mm-hmm. that is the show. Thank you very much for joining us. We always appreciate it. Keep reading DC Comics. And remember to never get lost in the Speed Force. Bye.